than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Also, what a way also, to start I the just stream. Started the, yeah. yeah, I just started the stream. <laughs> I really hope they, that it picked up you saying excrement. I think that'd be funny. Yes. That's, I, I aim to start every stream with excrements. That's, you know, <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you release uh, the baggage, you're free to get on with the day's chores. All right, so hello everyone. Hi, hello Hi, people in chat. everyone. What's up? How's everyone sorry. doing today? How you guys? Sorry what? about the delay in uh, in the intervened events happened, but we are back now. Life got talk... away. Yeah, yeah, I, life got so, away. And now... I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and say this before we even like. I was sick, so I didn't want to do it uh, last Sunday, and then Jolly's been out of Wi-Fi for like a week, so we just had just had obstacles. But we're still planning on doing the next stream uh, this coming Sunday, and we'll be we'll be back on schedule once we've done that. But yeah, it, it's no secret that ah Ahsoka Episode Six has just come out yesterday, and we're breaking down Episodes Three and Four, so we're a little behind. Yeah, we will be caught up though by next week. Um, so after Sunday, we will be <clears> right there with everybody else. Um. Yeah. So I guess. Um, that's just the that's just where to begin, right? Like we are talking about Ahsoka, and we Episodes love it. It's three great. And four. It's oh yeah, it's one wonderful. Of the best shows it's, out right now. Yeah, it's just genius. I, 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 I guess let's just get this one out of the way because we saw the comments obviously when we were gearing up. The first two episodes, I think we were pretty we were pretty good faith. We were pretty charitable. We were like we were. you know it's not it's not phenomenally good. It's not terrible. It's just meh. But like man, did we give that thing every chance? We were really rooting for it. I, I think it's fair to say, and then, and then, episode three. At the very and four least, happens. like if if not rooting for it, at the very least, we were like, it hasn't destroyed everything yet, and it might not still. So yeah, here's we were hoping. We 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 were really rooting for it. We were really, man, I had my hopes. But yeah, episode three and four then happened, and we're talking about them today. And there's things to say, and then episodes five and six <laughs> happened. And now I just want to die. I am. I I can't believe I'm about to say this unironically, but I'm mad over a TV show. Oh yeah, I, I think so I'm past angry. mad. I I didn't think I didn't think it was still within my capacity with Star Wars to become angry with what I was watching. Like I did not think I could yeah. still do that. Oh hey, Joe yeah. sent a super chat. Hey Joe. Hey guys. Sorry, I can't stay. I have some work to do. Appreciate your work, even if I disagree. Love you, Joe. Also, I'm glad yep. I turned her against you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, because like yeah, episode, yeah, episode three and four, views. and episodes five and oh yes, <laughs> and then episodes five and six nice. happen. And just like I, you, I like you, when you're saying like you were mad at a TV show, and like yeah, that's a fair reaction. But like I'm now so far past angry. I'm just like the. Sh I, I've had to like, kind of like compartmentalize it. Like this can't, like it's just, it, it's not Star Wars. Whatever this thing is, it's just not real. It's not, it's not a proper TV show. It's not really like a part of the Star Wars universe. I can't, I can't have that in my brain because if I do, everything collapses. Like the entirety of my love for Star Wars goes out of the window, and I refuse to sacrifice that on the altar of Disney Star Wars's pathetic attempts to rake in cash. So I just kind of have to mm -hmm. just pretend it's not. You know, it's really bad fan fiction, and that's what it is. But. On a purely artistic level, outside of my love of Star Wars and just in terms of wanting good storytelling, on that level, I'm fucking furious. <laughs> like how, how does this get signed off on? I don't understand. I think the thing is, like, and I said this with my, I remember when Kenobi was coming out, right? Like, and I and I've made this argument before when uh, people said that Kenobi's really good. People will defend it by saying, "Yeah, well, I just like seeing Obi Wan and Vader." And my th my my pushback was always like, "If you like Obi Wan and Vader." you should hate this show for what it does to these characters. Oh, and now yeah. I'm seeing people that are Rebels fans, and I'm a huge Rebels fan. I fucking show for that shit. Um, and they're like, yeah, I'm just happy to see Ezra and Sabine and Hera and all that. I'm in Chopper, and I'm happy to see all these Rebels references. And I'm like, if you like Rebels, why is this show not pissing you the fuck off? Because it's pissing well, me guess, off. I don't know. I guess my only... The only thing I can give them here is like maybe they just didn't have a particularly, and I say this without trying to sound like a dick, so I apologize. But maybe they didn't have a particularly like deep understanding of those characters from the original show. Like maybe there was, yeah, they're not seeing the contradictions just purely because they're not seeing enough depth to those characters in the first place to mine a contradiction from them. I don't know. I just I'm trying to understand. I I really am. 
Um, but I, 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 I'll be honest, uh, so I'm struggling. I, I can't understand why people are shilling for this. Someone in chat just asked if you if I could turn your mic settings down because I guess you're louder than me. So I've adjusted it a little bit. Hopefully that's better. Uh, guys, right, just let nice. me know if the audio levels are good. Uh, I'm being silenced. <laughs> <laughs> we're censoring the jolly chap. Yeah. So anyway, so... yeah, uh, we are here to talk about episodes three and four. And now the thing is, episode three was one of the biggest nothing burgers that I've ever watched. Um, there's really not that much to say about it. I think we're going to skip past it in, in half an hour. Um, so the yeah. bulk of this stream is going to be covering episode four. And, um, and, and, there, and there's a lot to say about episode four. So yeah, yeah. Uh, like how do you, oh, you want to do this, Jolly? Well, I guess I guess before we start the breakdowns, did you want to talk about the 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 kind of state of, of the right. backlash on Twitter? Yeah, yeah, you're right. The other thing that I wanted to address before we started was um, so I when episode five came out and um, they you know had those vacuous Clone Wars flashbacks with you know the young Ahsoka and Hayden Christensen in the Clone Wars armor and oh look it's Captain Rex and oh look it's Vader and blah 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 blah. It's the siege of Mandalore. Remember that thing? I I tweeted out how basically just my concern that like Ahsoka's actress Ariana Greenblatt. Uh, who I think played young Gamora in Infinity War and has been in a few other things recently. Um, I I just think that she's uh, like not very well cast, just in terms of like she looks too young to play seventeen year old Ahsoka. Um, I think she works fine for fourteen year old Ahsoka, but like they probably could have cast like an older actress for the seventeen year old. Because and people like defended that by saying shit like you know she's sixteen now, and it's like so that means she was like late fourteen, early fifteen when they filmed this. Plus, she has, like, a baby face. The point is, yeah. So I criticized that. And because of that, I've been accused of, you know, the the, the typical stuff. Sexism, uh, bullying the actor, uh, you know, all, all that sort of thing. Being a toxic piece of shit. And, um... Yeah, being a right-wing uh, misogynist. The level... Yeah, and the level of, of sheer vitriol that I've been I've been seeing coming from Ahsoka fans for not just in response to that tweet, but just in in general, like anytime I say anything negative about Ahsoka, has been disgusting. It's it's embarrassing, actually. And I've been saying this to Jolly, and I've been saying this to a few other people. It has gotten so bad that like I don't think the I don't think it's been this toxic in the fandom since the Last Jedi discourse. Oh, C's here. Hey, C. Yo, yo. How you doing? Hello, C. Hey, how you guys doing? Do you have a fan no, just on? A... Because if you do, oh, then yeah. I'm going to make you turn it off or I'm kicking you. Nah, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Suffer with the rest Suffer. of us. <laughs> yeah. No but yeah we, were just, here. we were just discussing the <laughs> um, the incredibly vitriolic response to anyone who criticizes the show that's come out of... I, I guess, like, it's it's uh, it's their turn to be criticized. It's predominantly the left um, who've been doing this. Like, like, a kind of left-wing grouping of the fans who are like, if you criticize the show... You just hate whammon. You're a misogynist. Um, like, oh, fucking hell. I hate to break this to people. This is the, almost the reverse Gina Carano stuff. I hate to break this to people, but like, whether or not women or any other minority or group of people are in a show or not has no intrinsic relation to its quality, which means it can be good and it can be bad. And it can be bad despite having mm -hmm. those women in it. Even if they're good actresses, even if yep. they're doing that utmost to make it work. Well, I said um, this in my Indiana Jones video, is Helena Shaw. She's a terrible character, and you can criticize her or praise her completely absent of bringing up anything to do with external politics. She just is a character in a self-contained film. It, it, there's no need to bring anything up outside of the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just... I, I, I'm, I'm just... I'm very yeah. tired. And it does seem to be like a primarily a Disney thing right now. But I'm really tired of these, these TV shows one way or the other being used as like political litmus tests like if you like it you're this thing if you don't like it you're this thing um no nuances allowed no discussion of the actual media's quality and its construction is allowed it's everything is just some kind of like tribal dance and it's really aggravating it needs to stop and also the reason it needs to stop above all is because it leads to very serious consequences like people being hounded online for voicing very innocuous opinions um, i would hope mm -hmm. and i'm gonna I, I think it's probably the case i would hope that everyone in the chat right now is grown up enough that they were not engaged in that kind of gish galloping nonsense pile. Um, however, I would politely ask, and please do so politely, please don't join in on the vitriol, but if you see people doing this, or if you know people who do this, very politely point out to them why it's really stupid. Just just try and gently nudge them back towards common sense. 
because I think we all need mm-hmm. to collectively like move society towards growing the fuck up. Yeah. You guys, you're my fan right now. The, the, no. Perfect. All right. Cause I said, it, I put on like a noise suppressor. So. Oh, good. Um, but yeah, no, just, just to round this out before we get into the episode. Yeah. That's, that's basically been it. Like it's, it's already made it to the point where I'm tired of talking about this show and just want to stop. The discourse surrounding the show has just been that fucking toxic. So yeah, if you see people acting like that, uh, t- try to try to convince them why they're being toxic. If they continue being toxic, just block them. They are really not worth your time. That's what I've been having to find these last several days. I've just been on like a block spree. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's that's been, that's the that's the kind of bureaucracy dealt with. That's the the all the filing dealt done and dusted. Let's talk about the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just so good! Yeah. Oh, it's so wonderful! So, okay, I can, the, the way I think we should do this, right? Is Sheev, do you want us? Do you want to do a little walkthrough for us of like episode three, and then we can just stop when we when we get to the silliness and discuss it? I will walk us through the plot of episode three as I remember it. But to be honest, it's like so many episodes have come out since then. Just based like from from memory, uh, like we start off with with Sabine training with Ahsoka or with Huyang rather, uh, and he's he has some sort of like training lightsaber game thing, and uh, he's basically just putting her down. He's like putting her putting her in her place, which is like a Chad move. Um, <laughs> it. I, I don't have. I'm I'm just gonna lump. See, here's the thing. Again, I want to get through episode three really quickly. So I'm going to kind of lump this all together here, talk about Sabine's training and like what it is and what's happening and like what what seems to be being implied about her force sensitivity. But before I do that, I'll read out the super chat from Lance for $5. Read the expanded universe. Lance, you know that I've read the expanded universe. You fucking know I read the EU. But thank you for the money. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, I just want I, I just I just want to say like so Sabine is force sensitive, except she's not force sensitive, except anyone can do it, except also it takes talent. Um, so not anyone can do it. I don't know. What do you guys make of any of this? Because the show is being intentionally like vague to the point of being obtuse. Well, that's the kind of thing I'd say, and like, there's, you can make this point more generally, and, and we will when we get to later episodes in episode four, when it comes to like character arcs and things. I don't understand what the show is trying to tell me about anything. I do not understand any of the themes the show is trying to convey. I don't think the show does either. And so we have this mm-hmm. kind of like extremely vague model model of like, oh, is she? Isn't she? Self sensitive? Does it or does it not matter? Um, and rather than like some kind of direction being taken on this, it's just essentially being left to the kind of audiences like as a pick a mix um it, it just because it's just there's just nothing there to supply information really one way or the other and other than it being enormously frustrating to wade through as an audience member because again i have no idea what the hell they're going for and so i just feel like my time is being wasted uh, it also just makes the state of this world extremely confused um it's it's almost uh, it's almost like a very watered down version of you know the Ray problem of like Ray having all these powers out of nowhere and, and how that affects how we understand force powers and things. This is almost like the other way, like oh anyone can be force sensitive. Mm-hmm. Oh really? Well okay. Well then what's the point of finding force sensitive children? Surely you could just grab anyone. Oh but talent matters. Oh talent matters. Oh well then not everyone can do it. So training a Sabine as a Jedi is really pointless and a bit strange actually considering that she's a Mandalorian and they're culturally quite anti Jedi. I know she's got history, but like, I don't see why Sabine would value Jedi training above just being Mandalorian if she can't do the, anything to do with the Force. I don't know. It's just it, it all just seems yeah, like it's just there to circle jerk people. It doesn't seem to be for any real point. Yeah, and and again, so like you, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, this is something that I've pointed out a few different times now, and something that I keep observing with how Dave Filoni writes. He is very good at being extremely vague to the point where you don't actually know what is being said, what is being introduced into the story. It's sort of just happening. And before you can even really give it any thought, because you're given very little, little information to go on, they just move on. And it's, there's like more stuff to break down the amount of world breaking things that are introduced into the show, like has collapsed in on itself almost in terms of just sheer volume. 
like to the point where like the whole anyone can be force sensitive question mark is one of the least of its problems. Yeah, I, I, it kind of reminds me. This is this is a, a, a ye oldie reference, so I apologize if there's any younglings in the in the audience who are not going to understand this. For those who remember the animated Teen Titans show back in like the early two thousands. There's an episode where they go into like a TV world. They get pulled by like a, a magic TV remote, basically, into like a TV world. And part of it is like literally a ripoff of Star Wars. And at the end, they're like, they're all asking each other, like, oh, well, what was the moral of this episode? And Raven's like, well, you know, it's, it teaches us that TV rots your brain and you should do other things. And then someone's like, yeah, but we only we only prevailed because one of our members is a massive uh, like t- couch potato and knew all the TV off by heart. And then Cyborg's like, oh, I guess there was no point to this episode. And they all just start laughing and the episode ends. <laughs> and it just kind of feels like that. Like everything that comes out of Disney Star Wars seems to be that, but without any of the self-awareness. That reminds yeah. me of that one Rick and Morty joke uh, when I can't remember. It was, I think it was like season four. Um, the whole plot of the episode had happened. And it was all just a bunch of random nonsense like usual. And then, like you know, the conflict was resolved or whatever, and Rick just kind of said, "There's a lesson to be learned here, but I'm not, I'm not going to be the one to figure it out." And then they just moved on. <laughs> it's is it the men who stare at goats with J.K. Simmons, where they literally have that thing at the end, where it's like, "So what did we learn, <laughs> Gary?" It's like, "I don't know, sir. No, neither do I. Fucked if I know. I guess we learned not to do it again. Although I'm fucked <laughs> if I know what we did." <laughs> like, I don't know. It's all. <laughs> It's also odd. Anyway, yeah, so the training scene happens and and that gobble of confused lack of character and character motivations all kind of like tangled together into a big ball of wool trundles like, past our screens. But like, can we can we try to kind of break this down just in terms of like what this show seems to be trying to say? Oh, we could try. Like, I just, I just don't know. That just anyone gonna... can be force sensitive? What is, like, what does it, it mean? That because like what what they're pulling from is like the that the force resides in all living beings, which is true, but that does not fucking mean that anyone can use it. But then Ahsoka says that talent is a factor, and I'm like, so does that mean that only certain people can like it? That's that sounds to me like anyone can use it, but also you have it or you don't, which is this which is what we already knew, and which is something that didn't apply to Sabine originally, because force sensitivity was like a was like something that could be almost quantified. In terms of like your midichlorian count and everything, and how yeah, sensitive can, you were to the force, also, Cannon would have also sensed it at any point within the however oh, many years have, yeah. he with her. Like maybe like what, like eight years can- or something with her. Well, not just not just Cannon, but thing. Ezra if, and, like, and the ben- if- and the Bendu as well. That's true. Yeah, and even when they were training with the Dark Saber, so too, it- like that, at, at that point, that's when they should. Yeah, known. no. E- even if Sabine's force sensitivity is like cheer at Mway levels, and I, th- I think they're implying that much because she was able to sort of anticipate where Ahsoka would attack when she was blind. Um, even if we're talking like cheer at Mway levels, like Kanan and Ezra would have sensed that, the Bendu would have sensed that, Ahsoka would have sensed it back in uh, Rebels. Uh, that probably would have been something that came out when she was training with a fucking lightsaber. Like, yeah, no, there's no way. Like, the only way for this to quote unquote work is if they were to like retcon it that. Uh, they always sensed it, but like nobody ever decided to train her as a Jedi because why would you if she can't actually access the Force? At which point, the question then becomes, so why are we training her now? Uh, who knows? I also, like, yeah, if if, if we're going to train anyone, surely we'd be tracing, training Jason Sandula, but uh, we'll, Jason, get, yeah. we'll get... Yeah, we'll get to Jason when we get to Jason, because <laughs> there's things to say about Jason. There's a lot of um, things to say about Jason. Anyway, yeah, I, I'll tell you on a surface level, a very shallow level, I do enjoy watching Hoi Yang's training things. Like, it's nice to see a little bit more of, like, very young Jedi training kind of techniques, I guess. Like, it's really yeah, shallow. Um, it's very surf- surface level, but, like, it's nice to see. I don't really that, know if I, I understand the train. Like, this, actually, Andrew, he's in the chat right now. Um, he His video on Ahsoka Episode 3 kind of made me question like what the training even like what the point of that even was and like what what the actual objective of it was because and this is a a hyper nitpick so take this with a grain of salt if you want but like he has these like training i guess hollow projections of what are vaguely similar to lightsabers and um it tracks where sabine made contact quote unquote with them uh to determine i guess her fighting style or her discipline or whatever and like some of the some of the part her 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 precision okay 
some of the markings are white, I guess, to indicate that, you know, she did well. And some of them are red to indicate that those were poor strikes. And like, it all just looks kind of random and arbitrary in terms of what was a good strike and what wasn't. So I don't really know. Well, that's not that big a deal anyway. Yeah, you're right. It's not a huge deal, but it's worth again, like in the same way that when we've done these kind of hyper quote unquote nitpicks before, like the reason we point them out is not because we're just going like this is the be all end all, but because it reflects an underlying attitude on the behalf of the makers of these things that they're just not paying attention to the details, and that's worrying. Um, but yeah, like in, with previous things, like with lightsaber combat, and again, this is like why lightsaber combat combat is so like uh, balletic and so um, not overt. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Gar not garish, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's lots of flourishes, and it's very like over the top in some ways. The reason that's mm. the case is because Jedi can sense each other's intentions, you know, before they happen, which means you're constantly adjusting your footing and your strikes for possible futures, and not just the one, not just the present you're moment. Anticipating you're attacks, um, as well as the ones that are happening currently. Yeah, and so the best I can do for these like multiple arms is that it's almost like a general grievance situation where there's like multiple attacks coming at you from multiple different angles at once. And so you're being encouraged to dance out of the way of some of the strikes as well as hit others. But yeah, obviously Sabine can't do that because she can't sense possible futures because she has no no real force potential as Hoi Yang points out. So it does seem to be training that doesn't mm -hmm. have any purpose. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I'm pretty sure Ahsoka even says, where is it? Um... She, Hu Yang says something to the effect of she will never have like, she'll never be a Jedi basically and Ahsoka says I don't need her to be a Jedi and I don't know what the fuck that means what do you mean yeah, by you, that then what do you need her to be Ahsoka what do you need her for do you, why are you calling her your Padawan, why are you even taking a Padawan, you're not a Jedi, you don't consider yourself a Jedi I don't know. Well, again, what, what Ahsoka thinks of herself or doesn't think of herself is an entire other topic of conversation. We're going to have to wait for episode five yeah. and six to talk about that. But that's well, but basically, confused. yeah, but like it's, it's just funny that we have a Jedi teacher who doesn't consider herself a Jedi, but is also being a Jedi teacher, who's taken on a Padawan who literally cannot become a Jedi, but is being called a Padawan. And like people expect me to like take this show seriously, and people talk about how this show, like, like Dave Filoni really understands George Lucas's version of Star Wars, and I'm like, yeah, I fuck it, I guess, whatever. What a damning indictment of George Lucas and his intentions for Star Wars, but all right. It's um, so depressing. Final thing to That's say about this whole sequence with Sabine is, yeah, the the final thing to say about all this is just she like tries to force pull a cup toward her and it doesn't work, uh, and she like quips at it and then leaves. That's obviously being set up for some kind of payoff. We still haven't gotten it yet, though. I think you mean Darth Mug. <laughs> Not Cup. Darth Mug, indeed. The real the real antagonist <laughs> well, yeah, of this but whole like, either way, is, like... is not Thrawn, but the Mug. <laughs> either they're setting up that Sabine will eventually use telekinesis, which would fuck with just everything. everything. Or it's just going to be one of those setups that goes nowhere, which at this point wouldn't surprise me because... You know, this is just not a TV what? show. This is not a fucking story. If I had story. a nickel for every time Filoni has set up something that never got payoff. What, what are you talking I, I about? I don't in, in Disney Star Wars? Set up with no payoff? I can't imagine such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I just never. love how Filoni is obsessed with documenting every single moment of Ahsoka's light, yet we still have it zero explanation as to where she was during the Galactic Civil War. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently she was yep. apparently she was stopping Sabine from saving her family, which I, I, wow! I, oh what my a bitch. god! <laughs> yeah, I cannot wait to get to that shit. That's gonna be episode oh four, god. guys. So we're gonna we're gonna. It's horrendous. We're, we're yeah. Gonna... Good god! No, <laughs> very few characters come out of episode four intact. It's not good. It's carnage. That, it's character that is, carnage. That is something oh, yeah. interesting just about this show that they keep doing. They're they're, they're doing it with uh, Balin like hardcore. Um, they, they seem to be doing it a lot with like Ahsoka's characterization and like the what, like what happened between her and Sabine, where the show just kind of keeps alluding to the idea that that like a, a mystery will be solved or like questions will be answered, but then it just won't, and I don't think it ever will. Like we have two episodes left at this point, and all of these things are still left unanswered, and like I don't well, see how they're gonna fit in the last two episodes. 
it's not even that like there's a mystery that they set up that they're not going to pay off. It's like they uh, they haven't even set up a mystery. They're just like they you know we're just being told you know it's an informed attribute. We're being told there's a mystery. No work has gone into actually like detailing anything that kind of in any way illuminates what that mystery is or is about or anything. And then we're not going to get a payoff for it. Like it's a bit like if we'd gone into Indiana Jones, or, like you know Raiders of the Lost Ark, and you know, for ninety percent of the movie, we didn't even know what Indy was chasing. Like, imagine a version of that movie where they're like, "Oh, we're off to find a thing. What thing? I don't know. A thing. What? What does I'll the thing do?" Yeah. yeah, I'll tell you when we get there. It's like, oh, and, like every what? time he tells someone what he's after, he like shows them a picture, and then like we don't see what they see, but then the person that is being shown the picture like makes like a, kind of a surprise face, and then goes, yeah, "You know, that thing is a myth." Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then per- they never answer the a- movie. Peridia is a myth. Oh my god, Peridia! Jesus oh, Christ! Oh, Peridia! Peridia, oh. Peridia! Oh, have you met Peridia? Peridia, the tattoo lady. I don't know why. S- side note: it's because Peridia sounds vaguely similar. I always think that if it wasn't a disease, chlamydia would be like a pretty sad, like okay girl's name. <laughs> But like, <laughs> sorry, it's just one of those thoughts, like intrusive thoughts I've always had. It does sound like you know, you can imagine like an Oscar Wilde 19th century like play, like like ah, oh, like my, my the Duchess is just eager to meet you. Come down, my daughter, chlamydia. Oh, um, my friends said that I don't have intrusive <laughs> thoughts. They said that I am the intrusive thought. <laughs> yeah, I'm the I'm the boogeyman. I, I am the thing that intrudes. I am the one who knocks. <laughs> anyway, um, so that scene yeah, that but- scene happened. And now we're over to Hera. Hera is talking to... Well, she's waiting for a meeting with Mon Mothma and a bunch of senators via hologram. Um, leave her out of this. Leave Mon yeah, Mothma please leave. out of this show. <laughs> yeah, leave her alone, you fucking assholes. Like, this is where, is, mm-hmm. where is Mon Mothma? Is she I safe? Just got, is she all right? I just got C into Andor. He's finally seen it in its entirety. He understands yeah, the pain, Jolly. Great. It's That's so great. insufferable. Yeah. Like we have this great show here with great characters, and it actually, you know, has solid world building because it's so self-contained. And it's like, wow, this is fucking excellent. And then we have this garbage that I'm watching concurrent with Andor. And well, again, it can't be the same universe. It just can't be. Like no, it these can't things be. do not it just fit together. Work. Yeah. No, it's um, one of the like, one of these things mm-hmm. is not like the others. Right, um, it's, it's, it's like the biggest whiplash ever had in terms of media. Like I'm going from one show that actually gives a shit about the characters and world and the stakes and just what happens in it. It makes sure that everything that happens is logically driven. But then we got Ahsoka, where shit just fucking happens. You can you can roll an infinity sided dice and then it's going to land on one side, and that's what's going to happen next. I guess I don't know. Yeah, can you imagine what someone like Tony Gilroy could do with the character of Thrawn? Oh, oh, to to live in that timeline, Sheev. To live in that timeline, <laughs> man. Oh, only. Okay, I already said like, cast Charles can dance and something like something like Andor. Get make him an Imperial. Yeah, or Christopher Eccleston, or someone of like, or Hugh Laurie, just someone of that kind of gravitas. Just or me, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, or me, yeah. Cast not not or even me. me as a person, just my imp, my little imp avatar. Cast him. Yeah, not just my Wait, logo. Castle he could be like a little. He could be like a little alien dude, little little imp yeah, looking can... guy with a top hat and a monocle. Little Bobby Freck. <laughs> Ironically enough, I feel like Jolly's like little avatar would be more Star Warsy than any of the stuff we see in Star Wars. Just a weird well, little alien. I guess also to be fair, I definitely have the accents to be an Imperial. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You crumpet. But yeah, so. So yeah, we're on the scene where Hera is going to talk to the senators. Um, this scene, ha- there's a lot to say about this scene. Well, I guess um, let's, start with, so, let's start with the shallow stuff, right? So like, I, I like I like the acting from Win- from uh, Elizabeth- Mary Elizabeth Winstead. I was about to say Winona Ryder for some reason, but yeah, <laughs> I think she, I think for some, she is mostly in this scene doing a good job, and that's nice because up until now she hasn't really emoted. Um, so it's nice to see that she can. Yeah, no, I like. I like because uh, Senator, D- Senator Ziona says the thing about uh, like your friend is dead, and she goes, "You don't know that." Kind of snaps at him. That was neat. I liked that. Yeah, little, little, little. Take I'll take our little victories where we can. She they're, they're going to become fewer and fewer <laughs> as we go on. Yeah, but yeah, then then we have I'm the a general, basically... nothing's off limits to me. Oh god, yeah, because this is so. 
the state of play is this. Um, Hera is reporting to Mon Mothma, the Chancellor, and her like inner retinue of, I guess, effectively the cabinet, right? Like, high-up senators. And mm -hmm. she's reporting on what's just happened in Corellia. And Hera's like, okay, I think what's happening is that there's an imperial conspiracy to bring back Thrawn. And Mothma's like, okay, do you have any evidence for this? Because that's quite the claim. Um, and Hera's like, no, I don't. Which, let's just get that. How do you not have evidence? You just you just arrested everyone uh, in So the thing is, the thing is, like with what the uh, New Republic should be able to know, I don't know that they could conclude that Thrawn is involved. But at the very least, there's there is irrefutable evidence that should be available to all of these characters that there's some kind of Imperial plot happening on some planet, and that like Corellia is involved in some way. Like this should be more what? than enough to take a contingent, uh, like take a yeah, fucking what... fleet and go to Cetos and see what's up. Well, it's not just that, because like, let's just tally up the information that is available to these guys, right, in terms of like, you know, what, which Hera could present to them. which is, or, that, or that at least uh, should be available to these guys. Yeah, which is that, like, okay, we, we were handed a, a high-ranking ex-Imperial prisoner by a, a former Jedi Knight who was a member of the Rebellion. Uh, that person was then broken out of jail by two lightsaber-wielding Force users who devastated an entire cruiser and killed the captain and crew. Um, said, mm -hmm. like, this was these, all on camera. This, this, yeah, this group of miscreants then... Uh, stole a map, according to our Jedi contact, our former Jedi contact, that is uh, very like dangerous potentially. They tracked her to Lethal, uh, a, you know, a world that's within the Republic. Stabbed a former Rebel war hero through the chest uh, or through the abdomen, I should say, um, nearly nearly killing her, and to retrieve this item. So clearly of great value to them. We then tracked them to Corellia, where they were using an un you know an undercover off the books uh, operation only made possible by a gigantic pro-imperial insurgency hiding within what is our most important shipyard, building engines far larger than even the largest engines we build for our fleets um, for unknown reasons. Mm -hmm. And then as we, chased, as we chased them from the scene, they shot at us and a former Sith Inquisitor turned up to try and kill us. This is all on camera. They have witnesses, they have data, they have evidence, they have like manifests and logs and eyewitness testimony and medical records how Security the hell, cameras yeah how the hell is this is there at least not enough for hero to be like i request a detachment of troops to go and check out where we think they are because you know i managed to put a tracker on their ship yeah through some bullshit Chopper also is like the best name ever side, side, side note i find this really funny because one of the things they tell her is like we can't spare the resources because we're, th we're stretched thin but then when she commits a mutiny, <laughs> they send they send three entire cruisers to arrest her. So I <laughs> yeah. guess you do have the resources, you lying dipshits. Like I, oh. Yeah. It's all it's all just yeah. So the they're 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 essentially trying to set it up that like the for whatever reason, uh this inner council of uh, of senators don't believe that there's any kind of threat at all. And it's like you can't do that. That that literally just doesn't work. The, I, I like the only reason I think that they made Hera even mention Thrawn, which is something I don't think she would do, given that these senators apparently see, um, like, see it as a personal thing for her, like a personal bias that's getting in the way of her being objective. Um, so I don't know. I don't think she would have brought up Thrawn. Um, but I think the only reason that they had that happen was so that there might be some able, like, some ability to cast doubt on the validity of anything that Hera is saying. But at the same time, like that just doesn't work because even it, whether or not Thrawn is involved doesn't matter. We have irrefutable evidence that something is going on on Cetos. Yeah, and then there's the next level like of this, imperial which is like, activity. The, the next level of this is kind of funny, right? Because like obviously, they sh Hera should be able to give these guys evidence, but for whatever reason, she chooses not to or can't, which means that the you know one of the generals uh, of a fleet, which is you know operates under these guys' purview decides to randomly like accuse one of them of essentially high treason um because she's not getting her <laughs> way and uh, mm -hmm. and like people were going like oh well you know star wars resistance he's a villain and i'm like okay but you unless that's brought up in this no, show he's that not. He's working for the empire like yeah first of all i don't even know if that's true but even if it was true like there's no I, information on that in this area so, so you can't have that i haven't seen all of resistance so maybe but like from what i understand she was the one just, resistance fan was on I'm not. I don't even like that. But he was in the first episode of that show, and I, from what I remember, all that we got from him was he's a senator who doesn't believe in the resistance because for some reason the resistance and the New Republic weren't on good terms. Um, and then he died when Hosnian blew up. Like that's it. I, I'm pretty sure that's all we knew about this guy. 
actually, speaking of the sequel trilogy, Eric, can we just never forget that all of this stuff happens? The threat of Thrawn and Night Sister Witches and Dark Jedi yep. and all this crazy shit happens and the New Republic demon. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, again, the thing I said before the stream started was like, we were already in the in the kind of camp of being like, these things, this, you know, the Disney stuff cannot exist harmoniously in the same canon as the previous stuff. Like, it just can't. It just doesn't function. But we're now at the point where, like, the Mandoverse stuff just can't function with the sequels. Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't understand how you break your own canon to that extent, even forgetting the OT. But that's the sequel fans anyway. stay winning. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, sure. Well, if that's winning, I hate to see what losing looks like for you guys. My God. <laughs> mm -hmm. Get some. Let's uh, be real. They're losing um, every day. Well, this is the harshest I'm going to be to these people, but like, uh, fucking get some self respect, please. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, but no, yeah. She says, and I quote, there, like... she says, and I quote, Were you ever in the war, Senator? Just sat back and waited to see who came out on top? Uh, so that's so exactly even all, just first putting all... aside, like, uh, so let, let, let's let's put to one side for a second like what that actually would imply uh because that's it's just stupid that's not something Hera would say uh she knows yeah, better I than agree. to lose her cool like that and and say something disrespectful to a superior after asking him for resources she wouldn't do that i'm sorry that's not something Hera would do yeah and that's um, not even that's just like one that. point there there are many reasons why this man might not have been involved directly in the rebellion. Maybe he was trying, you know, mm -hmm. maybe he was in a too public a position. Maybe he was a senator before the war even broke out, and therefore, like, he was just doing his best within the system to protect his own people from the fallout. Maybe he was secretly funneling mm -hmm. resources to the resistance. I mean, one imagines he probably was right, because there's no way he'd be on Mothma's inner retinue if there was in, if he was ever, like, a pro-imperial senator. Correct. <laughs> we don't know what he did. The show there's really... not information right now to make that conclusion. Like... It's ridiculous that people are assuming like the scene, yeah, no, the scene is right. really trying to be commentary. The scene is trying so hard to be commentary on the idea that yeah. the wealthy and the elite are exempt from uh like oppression and uh you know being on the receiving end of it. Um but like nah, just because he didn't fucking grab a blaster and take up arms in the rebellion does not mean that he was pro empire or like he was somehow apathetic to the plight of the people that were suffering. What a yeah. what a and tone this... deaf and just and just stale well, way to go about this kind of commentary. yeah. And in fact, it's given the fact that like this guy is in Mothma's inner retinue. There's just no way. There's just no way that he was pro imperial. Yeah, it just wouldn't make any sense. Let's just take a look at Basil Regno before the thing. Uh, Kenobi destroyed him. Is he's a character who had his entire family and planet at risk of being subjugated if he were caught aiding the rebellion. So yeah, no, they're heavy, heavy stakes for these people. It'd be the the deaths of potential thousands or even millions of people if they fuck up like of course they're not going to just directly take up arms yeah and his own family potentially as well right. i mean that was mothma's thing right like if she gets caught you know fraternizing with the rebellion and luthan rail it's not just her own head on the chopping block it's mm -hmm. like her planet her daughter her husband mm -hmm. like i know she doesn't really care about her husband but like her daughter <laughs> she does i think and as yeah and as we and, all know she like, her husband I, is actually Marek. <laughs> yes, of course. But so Jolly and I were talking about this a couple of weeks back about like who would be in Mothma's inner circle and what exactly the the state of the Republic would be at this point in the timeline. It doesn't make sense. So here's the thing, right? This isn't just like a democracy, right? Just like any old uh, like Tuesday at the Republic before the Empire broke out. We're still like like very soon after the fall of the Empire and we're still building this government. So, like, there would be a state of uh, essentially what, what, what did you? How did you put it, Jolly? There would be well, a state a dicta of like martial almost, law, basically. Well, not martial law, but a, a, a dictatorship, a temporary dictatorship, almost in the model of like a Roman-style dictatorship. So, basically, like, it's it is not possible to go from uh, a, a kind of like Nazi-esque empire to a functioning democracy overnight you need to have like a good five or six years of essentially like a military dictator or like some like some benevolent dictator who is who has the power to bypass all the corruption and the red tape to systematically tear apart the old system and put the the infrastructure in place to have a functioning democracy like it happened in japan after world war ii america occupied japan for five years macarthur was effectively the shogun of japan for five years uh, and korea um, you know, it happened in Germany after the war. Like, West Germany was just, like, completely run by the Allies for, like, five years. Because, you, of course. You, otherwise, if you just let, you know, if you just, like, okay, it's a democracy, everyone go, you essentially get what happened in the Arab Spring, where you just a new dictator pops up to fill the vacuum because people aren't ready for it. 
Um, there's, there's, there isn't the infrastructure in place to then carry out these democracies unless you take the time to put it there. The, the point of all this is, is, you know, to summarize, is Mothma, who isn't some namby pamby wet, you know, she's not Valorum. She is a she is a hardened pragmatist who was willing to sacrifice lives for greater good. She would essentially be the Cincinnatus of this universe. She would be very very aware mm. of the need to be like almost un, you know and, and unafraid of being unpopular in this regard. She would be very aware of the need to like forcibly bring the Republic back to a stable point and then quietly exit. Right. So at this point, the powers she should be wielding should effectively be the same as like Palpatine's before the Declaration of the Empire. Right. Like when he was had emergency powers and wartime right, powers. Emergency powers. Yeah, this is a state of emergency. Like the Republic is in a, is, the early Republic right now is in a pretty constant state of emergency. In fact, we know that it is because Mandalorian told us that like pirates are attacking everything in the mid rim and there's still remnants of the Empire. Did you say the P word? Sorry? <laughs> oh, pirates, yeah. So, yeah, essentially, <laughs> essentially what we're saying is that there wouldn't be anyone in Mothma's inner circle like making decisions that would go against like what she ultimately sees as the best for. Uh, the Republic, and she, like they would all be very pro rebellion. They would heed the advice of whatever Hera is telling them because they know that Hera is a war hero. Yeah, and um, uh, I mean, even putting aside anyway. the fact that there's mountains of evidence, yeah, Mothma should be able to override them anyway. But even putting that aside, like there are just mountains of evidence anyway that they that they're just willfully ignoring in order to make this be the plot, so that Hera has to like take you know sort of rogue. Uh, elements and go and go investigate this herself and get into trouble, which I don't even know what the point of that is. Like, it, has that actually had an effect on the overall plot in any way? No. Um, oh, yeah. No. That being Hera, Hera not having like an officially government-sanctioned mission to Setos, because they they still could have showed up too late, and then yeah. Ahsoka still could have left in the mouth of the whale. As stupid as that fucking is. Oh my god. We'll whale. get into that eventually. <laughs> Those whales. Yeah, I have nothing so much really to say about has those whales. changed. Nothing really has changed except for the fact that Hera and Teva are both fucking like basically a a against the Republic now, for all intents and purposes. Yeah. Well, so well, essentially, we have the same plot we would have had anyway, but now it's in, it's, it's much much stupider, and it's it's not just stupider in a kind of like technical sense. It's also stupider in a character sense because now Hera's had to do some really insane nonsense that's anti her character. And also because Carson Tava is involved and he was on the same base as Zeb, I guess Zeb just didn't turn up to help Hera. Which like well man, that's some damage to Zeb. So the one thing that needs to be said is we don't know where the fuck this show is supposed to take place in the timeline. For all we know, Mando season three is taking place concur concurrently with or after this this season. Which means, for whatever, like for all we know, Zeb isn't even on Adelphi at this point. He hasn't even gotten there yet. No, no, Maybe we, he we just do know. Showed he, up. We do know because he says specifically that he's come from Adelphi base. No, yeah, I'm saying Zeb. We don't know. If oh, he's right. So there Zeb yet. might be there. I, I like, guess what they I could guess, say uh, is that Zeb just hasn't gotten to Adelphi base yet. He's off doing something else. Right, I guess that's technically true. The problem I have with that is like, while there's been nothing to explicitly contradict it, I this can't function if that's true. Like, Taylor's whole point in the like his plot arc in the Mando season three was to be like, oh, I think I think the Empire is making a move, and I think that they're on their way back. Um, well, if this is after that, then you don't. That's not a thought. You know this. Like you saw it happen. Mm -hmm. You saw them go get Thrawn, and I can't imagine that the series is going to end with Hera and Taylor unaware that Thrawn has returned. So Mando season three makes absolutely no goddamn sense if that's if I mean it already did, oh, like but like even more so. Yeah. <laughs> also, the other thing is like I guess that means that like Pe Peleon was definitely bullshitting the Shadow Council. So I guess that's damage to Peleon's character, depending on how you want to interpret him. So huzzah. Well, unless Thrawn <laughs> unless Thrawn doesn't does make it back and is like still in power by the time this season ends, which is possible uh, and probably likely, even if he's going to be the villain of the fucking Mando movie. Uh, well, no, my point is, I know... militarization. Well, no, because my point is that the Mando verse well, I, I, that you can't, ex you know, there's nothing to explicitly rule out the idea that it's after Ahsoka, but like all the contextual information is anti that. And so, if the Mando happened first, that means Peleon was saying he got orders from Thrawn before Thrawn ever made it back. So he was lying. Mm -hmm. Or this, or Mando season three takes place after Ahsoka, in which case Thrawn is around, but that fucks with the timeline in different ways. Yeah, and also it, it flies in the face of all the contextual evidence and makes Tabor incredibly stupid. 
there's no sense to be drawn out of this. Either, love, either way around, it's bad. I, I love the Mandoverse. It's just so well written. <laughs> it's so great, yeah. Um, oh, anyway, so yeah, Hera, have, Hera, is there anything more to say about the scene with the senators? No, just the, just what happens when she comes out of the room, right? Because obviously they tell her to fuck off, because, like, obviously. Um, and also, like, I'll, I, I guess actually this is one thing. I will side the senators. If I'm those senators and I have a general who has a history of, like, a, a very personal mission and wasting resources on a very personal mission that's never panned out and are chasing, like, a, essentially a ghost story for 10 years... Um, and then she's like, I want to chase that again. And I'm like, well, we're spread thin. We don't have a lot of resources and you've given me no evidence. So no, you can't have your battle cruisers. Go back and do your damn job. Um, so I'm with the senators on this one. But anyway, she leaves and she's, she's upset. Well, she leaves and then ignoring the all, the, all the uh, other context. Yeah, I'm, I'm with the senators here. Yeah. Anyway, she, she leaves and out in the, ha the hallway. We see, uh, we see Jason. Good old Jason Sindler and Chopper. And uh, Jason is basically like, I mean, it's a very silly conversation, but the upshot of it is like, oh, I want to, I want to be a Jedi like my dad. And Hera's <laughs> like, yeah, I know, I, I know you do, kiddo. And the implication is that she doesn't want that. Um, which mm -hmm. I guess it's worth talking about now. What are the reasons? Because here's the thing: like, Hera obviously fell in love with a Jedi, was essentially a mother figure to a Jedi. She's known Jedi. Um, she's pretty cool with Jedi. So why? You know, yeah, would you not want but Jason both of them are Jedi? lost. Kanan died, and Ezra's gone missing. So maybe oh, she no, no, doesn't no. want the same thing for Jason. I'm, I, I, I'm aware. I'm just trying to set this up right. Of like, so the only the only potential character thing here is like maybe it's because like she has seen what's happened to the other Jedi she's loved, and so that she doesn't want that for Jason because because she she's worried that Jason might be put in danger by that decision. Well, yeah, of course. She's his mother. You know, she would never want his life to be in danger. She would never do anything to specifically uh, facilitate that in any capacity. Well, exactly. Like, you know, what kind even. of mother? What kind of mother would do that? Would take her a child, especially after this scene, which only makes sense with that motivation that she wants to protect her, her child. Which you know, that's very natural. So of course, man, I really hope that stays consistent. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Uh, we yeah. then have the approach. The approach to do they actually name the planet? It's the planet where they're building the hyperspace ring and where the where the henge is. Cheetos. Oh, oh Cheetos. Cheetos. Yeah, that's right. Cheetos. Um, We're Cheetos. Oh, Cheetos from now on. Yeah, the oh, planet yeah. Cheetos. Oh, wait, you know that's that's Kool Aid Man. Fuck. Kool -Aid. What's that's what's the Cheeto guy? Che Chester Cheeto. What's Chester Cheeto's catchphrase? I have no I idea. Know. We don't even eat them here. They're not they're not a thing you can buy in the UK. Really? So I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, Chester Cheese. I need to know. I prefer Tough Man. Oh, yeah. It's not easy being cheesy. Oh, Never that's say that again. Right, so on the, on the planet, not easy being <laughs> cheesy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the planet where I am informed it is quite difficult to become cheesy. Um, yeah. They, Indeed. yeah, they turn up. Ahsoka and Ho Yang and Sabine turn up, um, and there is, you know, there is the giant hyperspace ring that um, Morgan Elspeth has been building. And as they're approaching it, they get attacked by a squadron of fighters led by Shin Hattie and Marok. Um, so Shin Hati. Uh, Shin Hati, yeah. <laughs> um, do we start with the character stuff for Shin and Marok and Morgan, or do we start with like the incredibly terrible? choreography of the fighting i think we could let's get the fucking space battle just out of the way because because there's the yeah, thing i tried so hard to take bullshit. notes on this but like every time i watched it my eyes just glazed over uh, my brain like actively rejected the information that it was receiving well so the, i want this there's two comparisons i want to make because it's really funny so do you remember in Empire Strikes Back when we had like the the, the chase of the you know all the all the Tie Fighters and the Death and the Star Destroyers chasing the Falcon, and like in mm -hmm. particular there's like these great you know these great shots of like them weaving dynamically in and out of asteroids and suddenly diving and like we see like this upward shot of the Falcon escaping with the, the Star Destroyers looming overhead and taking evasive action, and it's all very intricate and beautiful and, and nice to watch. There's that. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, and this one is far more, and literally the point where, like, what happens, listeners, is uh, fighter, you know, enemy fighters keep flying past Sabine's gun turret from her right to her left. So, you know, going left across her bow, basically. And it just reminded me so strongly of Blue Harvest, 
you know the bit where he's like um oh don't worry man i'll lose them i know some maneuvers, <laughs> know maneuvers. Like, yeah he's, dr- he's he's drifting lazily to the left he's listing lazily to the left that's all like, you're doing that is happens. listing lazily to the left <laughs> <laughs> Man, this guy knows some moves. But yeah, the the fighter pilots do that maneuver past past Sabine's gun turret, like not once, not twice, but like five times. Um, anyway, eventually Sabine remembers how guns work um, and shoots a couple down. Uh, Shin and then talks to this. Is, this will be important for episode four. Shin says something to Marek. He's like, "Okay, form up on my right wing." And Marek responds. He speaks, and he's like, "As you wish." So Marek, capable Marek, of thinking wish. and talking. Important to note for later. She realized when he said, as you (laughs) wish, what he meant was, I love you. I mean, to be fair, if I was working with Shin, I'd probably fall in love with her too. She's pretty gorgeous. Um, Yeah. No, I've already fallen in love with her. Um, But that's a separate thing. I could fix her. Uh, (laughs) I don't want to fix her. I just, just, yeah, it's fine. Fine. I love you the way you are. She could make me work. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, so. They get past these fighter pilots, and and Morgan Elspeth is like, "Oh, I'll take care of this, Shin," and she launches like a giant cannon that's attached to the the hyper ring at um, uh, Ahsoka's ship, and Ahsoka's ship takes like manages to dodge it, but like takes damage, and they're essentially drifting dead in space. Um, and Sabine is like, Hoi Yang is knocked out briefly for some reason, um, and Sabine gets to work fixing the ship, and Ahsoka gets out onto the wing of the ship in her spacesuit with her lightsabers to do absolute nonsense that I'll address in a second. But before we get there, there is one <laughs> there's one nice little character moment where Morgan obviously was like, oh, I'll deal with this, and then f- doesn't 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 get them. And Shin calls her up on the radio, and he's like, oh, congratulations, Morgan. You almost got them. And it's just this nice little moment of like subtle <laughs> character sass, where I'm like, oh, there's a character there. They have feelings and emotions, and they actually have like a personality. Almost. It's amazing. So, it's and almost we'll get like to this more later, but like, Balin... Balin and Shin are the only characters that I think I, any of us here are interested in at this point. Um, the, the most recent episode has sort of already started down the path of assassinating Balin, which I kind of didn't think that they could even do, because there's not much there. Um, but yeah, Balin and yeah, Shin, they're my favorite I like characters them. By, yeah, they're my favorite characters by virtue of having no character to be in with. Well, as in like, Shin and Balin have like little, <laughs> yeah. fr- they have like fragments of character. And, then, and nothing's been done to damage Shin so far. They Balin, lose the idea started. of them having characters. They pretend so they actually far. have traits and shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like Shin, Shin appears to have yeah. motivations that don't just like disappear and reappear at the whim of the writer and actually are somewhat consistent, which is nice to see. Better than as Raven low, in, that, in that case, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Just as low as that bar is. Like that is the bare. I don't know why people minimum. keep comparing her to Reva. Pe- people oh, keep comparing Shin to Reva. And I guess it's fair to compare them because they're both like new antagonist characters in like recent star wars shows but that's about where their similarities begin and end man reva wishes i don't know why they're being compared they're being compared i find in a lot of cases people are comparing them because they're both specifically female antagonists and then of course we end the political side of things where people get really Uh, really fucking obnoxious and we have people on both sides of the argument both in favor or against reva and both in favor or against shin be on the basis of the most superficial shit like race and stuff and honestly it's the most insufferable and uh, tiring conversation like i'm black and personally i just appreciate if we stopped t- making everything about like oh yes reva's bad because she's black or no she's fine she's gray you know don't treat a black villain so poorly and it's like she's just a bad character guys come on yeah that's just right well. if my representation really was actually want. good yeah, treat black characters like characters, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's basically all and I ask. The thing is, I, mean, I would I, prefer. I, don't... I would prefer Sorry. a version of this story where Shin is like a very well-rounded, fleshed-out character. Um, but in reality, all we really have is she's there. Whatever traits she's given, and all, it's all been very thin, but it hasn't been contradicted yet. And so, at that point, that's the best we can ask for. But yeah, I would prefer just... if she was better. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? Because just just to you know draw this comparison, if people are going to do this, like between Reva and Shin, like they're both terrible characters. Like, there's no getting away from this. Like, they're both awful. The difference is that like Reva has had a lot more focus and therefore like a lot more contradictions because the writers can't seem to write consistently, which makes her a bad character. I don't give a shit about her race in the final analysis of her as a character. It's not relevant. Um, ditto for her gender, and that's obviously goes true for Shin as well. Just yeah. as characters, 
it just, you know, I just want to listen to what they like as characters and their race and their gender are not relevant to their characterization. So I don't fucking care. With Shin, mm -hmm. less has been less focus has been given to her, and so she's been allowed to maintain at least self consistency with the few traits we've had of her so far. Um, and that, which should be like the most basic starting point for a character, but in this fucking Mandoverse, that is like the gold standard for what we're apparently able to achieve. So, yeah, I'm I. It's not even I'm interested in Shin. It's more just like of all the characters in the show, the only one I could even see myself becoming interested in is Shin. So I'm waiting for that, mm. and, it's, and it's, it's that potential will probably never be paid off. But at least it's there. At least it hasn't been squandered yet. Just the thing is, like, I kind of don't know what to expect, like with Shin in these next two episodes, because like from the trailers and everything, and just from like the general state of everything. I expected her to get a lot of focus and for her to be like a pretty poorly written character and that, you know, and like, it would be frustrating and that she'd probably get some sort of half-assed redemption arc. But like at this point, we're six out of eight episodes in and I don't know anything about her really. And I don't know what she wants. I don't know why she's doing the things that she's doing. So like they might do a quote unquote redemption arc, but really it'll just feel like, Oh, I guess you're good now. I don't know what you wanted before. So I don't know what, like, I don't know what part of you has changed, basically, because I don't know anything about you. But good for you that you're not evil, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, to get back to the dogfight, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I'm going to put something out there, and I'll be interested to see if you guys agree. Watching the dogfight, I just felt absolutely no weight to what was going on whatsoever. Like, the dogfight didn't feel like it had stakes. At no point was I, I was worried so for worried. our main characters. Yeah, I mean, Shit. a lot of that might come down to like the direction, the the directing, right? Because like it was, for some reason, very slow. Like it felt like everyone was just leisurely strolling through the the battle as if there was no, like as if there was nothing wrong, as if they weren't being chased and shot at. Like everyone was just kind of like, eh, we're here. Yeah, the cinematography, the the score, the character moments, all of it, it all screamed a lack of urgency. There was just no dynamism in what I was watching at at all. Um, mm -hmm. it felt like people were just going through the motions half asleep rather than actually engaged in a, in a fight for their lives or a desperate situation or you know like even when the ship is damaged and it's like oh I need to go out onto the wing and defend us it's all just like everything's so sedate that I'm just struggling to find mm -hmm. myself feeling like there's any real state well, I, I, care I just remember like watching it for the first time and just being lulled to sleep I couldn't I couldn't bother engaging I, it, like it was actively asking me not to I, I, yeah. Almost like I was being hypnotized, like uh, the like the fucking snake from Jungle Book telling me to just go to sleep and relax. <laughs> Trust in me. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know what's really weird is like uh, the the Jungle Book snake, the, the original one, not Scarlett Johansson. Uh, it's the same voice. It's, it's the same voice as Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, yeah. That that always that always no, baffled me that. when I first noticed that. Yeah, no, but I, I, it took me ages to realize that. I was like, man, I'll never see, think of <clears throat> Winnie the Pooh the same way. Christopher this Robin thing, better watch out. Uh, Disney actually reused a ton of voice <laughs> actors uh, through through their entire uh, filmography. Oh yeah, um, Claude Frollo, the voice actor for him, he was uh, uh, who was he? He was, he was in Beauty and the Beast. Uh, Gaston bribes him to uh, what was it to, like to capture the beast or something to just get the townsfolk to no no no, no he bribes him to send Maurice uh, to the asylum. Cucks like Gaston, no one cucks like Gaston. No one's ever gonna be quite like Gaston. That's a movie we should watch, actually. Started. We should! Maurice, was in, here. Yeah, see, Maurice I... was in here last night again, raving. Like, just starts dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, see, slow down, watching Maurice. a lot of classic Disney movies. We should, we should check out Beauty and the Beast. It's been a, it's been a minute. Yeah. It's good. I haven't watched it's, it in a while. It's a good film. Good little film, that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I always, I always like the implication because obviously it's set in France about the turn of this of the this, of that century, <laughs> which means that like Bell Bell has just married a noble lord about <laughs> five years before the French Revolution's <laughs> about to break out. <laughs> oh shit's gonna get real. They got away. It's okay. Yeah, I, I guess I like I, I'm just hoping for their sake. Yeah, that's, <laughs> why, they get that's cut, why they're doing get their heads cut off. at Disney World. They're all refugees. <laughs> yeah, it's like Gaston <laughs> is actually like a. Gaston wasn't like just like some thug. He was actually like a very pro-revolutionary like socialist who wanted to tear down, <laughs> tear down the bourgeois. <laughs> He's like, oh, Belle, she uh, thinks she's better yeah. than us because she can read. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so uh, the dog fight, the dog shit. Yeah, that was. It is. Yeah, 
It's awful. It's really bad. And also, like, then we have the incredibly strange decisions that, like, just add to the sense of it just being, like, completely meaningless and, and worthless as a, as a set piece. Because, like I said, Ahsoka goes and stands on the wing, which I'm going to just give them this and say there's some kind of anti-grab that's keeping her there. <laughs> but, like, she's standing on the wing, and rather than just, like, you know, form up in a huddle around their stranded spaceship and just, like, fire from every direction at once so that, you know, at a safe distance so that Ahsoka can't possibly defend it, they just do, like, flybys in one direction and all shoot one at a time. It's a bit like if, if anyone ever played, the, like, the original Assassin's Creed game when you're surrounded by enemies and they all they, they all just, like, wait in a circle around you and only one ever attacks you at once. Um, they're all just, like, queuing up and they always attack you in one direction. So it just completely feels, like, idiotic. It was that. They're all just flying in one direction, all shooting at her in one direction, you know, and they all fly close enough that she can swing at them with her lightsaber, which, like, why the fuck are you doing that? <laughs> Yeah, and she cuts one and a yeah. half. That's the thing that happens because all of these pilots are chronically <laughs> idiotic. Like I said, like my brain actively rejected all of this as I was watching it. I don't even remember what you're talking about. I'm just assuming it's true. <laughs> oh yeah, and then like and then Ahsoka, you know, she she jumps up to swing and cut one of these things, and like that apparently overcomes the ship's anti gravity and she starts like floating off into space. <laughs> and I'm like, man, you're so lucky that you're so lucky that Shin and Marek didn't come back at exactly this point and kill Wait, you. Wait, why? Uh, yeah. Why didn't she just have an attachment cable hooked up? I don't so know. That she wouldn't... Uh, you don't even need a fucking cable. Just use like a goddamn like. Also, well, you can also I just you, you, like so the last Jedi the force. is confirmed with Leia. You can just use the force to pull yourself yeah. back to the ship. So, oh, God, oh yeah. also, just these ships are supposed to be flying through like the vacuum of space and flying through these really dangerous areas and stuff, right? Where there's gonna be particles flying at super and even hypersonic speeds and shit so like how is it that like the ship's shields and stuff are able to just be easily fucking defeated by a goddamn lightsaber yeah i mean there's there's all sorts of well i, I guess uh, i don't know we just have to give them that because blaster bolts are basically the same thing as a lightsaber blade and they can hit the ships blaster bolts but, are like they have a ton of power behind uh, them though specifically ones fired from ships well I, this, is, this is actually something i want to talk about because this yeah, is not just in a circle to, problem yeah. this happened this happened in the Kenobi show as well, and it's happened elsewhere. I think it happened in Clone Wars and in Rebels. Oh yeah, what the I am not, fuck? I am, yeah. I am not happy. I am not happy with the idea that Jedi can deflect uh, b bolts blast from ships with their fucking lightsabers because these aren't just like bolts of light; they're bolts of plasma. They have mass and momentum, and like the ones fired from ships are going to be pretty hefty and going pretty fast. I'm sorry, you're not blocking that. You're going to get knocked fucking flat. Remember when Hondo shot at Grievous in the Slave One and it fucking knocked his ass down? Like he he wasn't yeah. able to just deflect that. That's how that should work. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's just no, there's just no way. It just, it just it's 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 not again like this is not just Ahsoka. Other things have done this. Reva did it, but it just annoys me every time. It's like they're literally now even the blaster bolts have no weight. They're just they're just there like tennis balls. Woo. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> somehow they get the ship up and running, sort of, and they flee down to the surface of the planet, and they locate the henge, like, they fly over the henge, which, like, I don't know how they do that, because there's a whole planet, and as far as I'm aware, the henge at this point is not giving off any signal for them to track. But they just, you know, they just so happen to fly over the henge. That's, that's good, I guess. They're being chased, and they, they manage to lose their fighter, their pursuing fighters in, like, the cloud layer, and then they hide in the forest. They're, like, you know, they touch down, Doesn't, turn off all the power, um... and hide. I'm trying to remember. I think in episode four, um, it may it may have been episode four or episode three or both. But I remember them saying something about having scanned the planet, and that's how because that's how Hu Yang was able to be like, yeah, they have a ground base this many clicks in that direction. Uh, go see what that's about. Like they All somehow right. just know where everything is on this planet, like with some kind of scanning yeah. technology. Sure, I, maybe I guess. I get maybe ships can do that. I don't know. There is, oh, we skipped over one thing. There is one thing I would like to talk about, just very briefly, because it's going like, to become relevant when we talk about hyperspace and how that works. Um, okay. So, so when uh, Balin and Morgan are like starting the upload, starting the, the, the kind of transfer of, of information from the Henge and the map to the hyperring, the exact line Balin says, uh, well, I'm going to have to paraphrase, so not the exact line, but basically he says, like, oh, if we don't have exact coordinates, we'll be lost to the void forever. Yep. So, so basically, the, the thing that's setting up is the, uh, this, the purpose of this map is to provide exact hyperspace coordinates because if you overshoot or undershoot, 
you'll be lost in space forever. Now, that makes no sense for any number of fucking reasons that I'll get onto, but I just want people to be aware that that's a line, that that's the justification for the map's existence that they used, because it's complete horseshit. Um, but we'll get onto that. Yeah. I can't wait. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, they, they park their ship, they turn off all the power, Hoyang shuts down for a little bit, and then a little bit later, they decide they can risk sending a signal to Hera, so they turn the ship back on, realize that the the, re the communications relay is, is damaged, so they're going to have to go fix that, um, but they're still trying to contact Hera. Um, and they ask Ho Yang what the results of him scanning the hyperring was, and they're like, well, yeah, what is this thing? What to, what's it doing? And he's like, it's a giant hyperring, uh, and based on, based on its engine design, he thinks it can go between galaxies. So... The ship with engines designed in the uh, Corellia shipyard can travel between galaxies. I want everyone to remember there's so this. so much to break down. Just oh so much God. hyperspace engines together and you're good to go. Like, you can do anything. Nothing matters um, anymore. Like, the thing is, we're going to, because we're going to talk about the logistics of all of this. I think after episode four is when we want to do that. Yeah, but, like, just in terms of, like, in this episode, this is when Huying like mentions directly that the information that he's getting all this from is from the Jedi archives. So the Jedi knew about Peridia and the supposed path to it, um, and like about extra galactic travel, and they've known about it this entire time. This was all on Jedi record. I don't know how Balin didn't like he considered it like a like a fairy tale. Uh, I guess the younglings weren't made aware of that. Like that's. I guess secrets for the masters. Apparently, I don't know why, uh, but I guess. Um, but yeah, j it's just worth keeping in mind that the Jedi knew about Peridia for thousands of years. Uh, yeah. But but somehow it's not public record because the, the, the thing is, like, you can't even infer that the galaxy at large knows about intergalactic travel, and it's just never been plot relevant at any point. Because, like, Ahsoka and Sabine are specifically asking Hu Yang if that's possible, as though it's not something that's ever been done before. So how do the Jedi know about it, but not the Republic? Did they not tell the Republic? I don't Why the know, fuck wouldn't guess, they tell the Republic? I guess not. I mean, there's 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 all sorts of... Uh, the, the logistics. So for those who are interested, listeners, I am, in fact, putting together a very long video. Well, not very long. I, I'm putting together an extensive video on ex on just breaking down this hyperspace thing and how it works and the physics behind it for those who are interested. We're not going to be going through all of that today, obviously, because we'd be here for hours. But I, I will give like a kind of brief synopsis. Mm. And if you find it interesting, please do check out the video when that comes out, hopefully sometime at the end of next week or the week after. Um, but yeah, just this, uh, suffice it to say, this can't function. None of this can work. This is all utterly, utterly broken. And the idea that in how long has this republic been around like well not the republic how long have people had hyperspace like twenty thousand years right a long ass time Twenty five thousand years very long time. right and an, an entire galaxy of tr uh, hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of thousands of species all of whom are you know and most of whom are capable of you know hyperspace travel at no point have they ever worked out how to get to this other galaxy or try to get to this other galaxy i i'm sorry i don't believe you just fuck off i just know i don't believe you let me address this super chat real quick from Hordak, ruthless leader of the evil horde, um, for five dollars. <laughs> if you want to watch some actual good shows, watch Spectacular Spider-Man, Batman the Animated <laughs> Series, and Transformers <laughs> Animated. I th are we being trolled? I, I, I think it's pretty, pretty cool though. <laughs> I haven't seen yeah, that. I, I just know that because SK and Southpaw specifically have videos or have like talked about how Spectacular Spider-Man and BTAS are bad. And from what I've seen of each of those shows, I can't say I disagree. Um, I, uh, I I like BTAS. It's not good. I love BTAS. It's 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 very close to my heart. It's not good. I, I hate to say. Yeah. It. Sorry. It's got I, great, I mean, if this was the great bits and pieces, if if this super chat was made in earnest, and you're not just like fucking with us, like I I'm sorry if that came off as mean or like condescending. Um, I I just don't think. I don't think those those shows are very good. At least the one from what I've seen of them. Oh yeah, actually, so uh, Dagoth Domino raises a good point. If Jocasta knew, like obviously, if this if this information was in the archives, then surely the Emperor now knows about this as well. Right, right. Oh yeah, no, I I mentioned all this and like I've I've said it in passing to you guys and on Twitter and whatever. Like yeah, um, not only are we going to get into the fact that um, the Empire had the means just on what on Corellia to build a hyperdrive ring that would allow them to. Uh, jump to other galaxies uh, but also the this information these records that lead to the like that have this exact path 
um, that lead to Peridia would be available to the Empire as well. So, like, yeah. I guess. I guess. It's all just fucking stupid. Yeah, that's that's anyway. That was episode three. Ugh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is there anything else in episode three that's worth? Uh, right. Let's see. Schematics of the ring. Um, yeah. No. That's episode three. Mo- Morgan sends Balin and Shin and a bunch of thugs to go attack their ship. That's that's the other thing. Oh, should also say, I think this was the episode that confirmed some sort of Purgle involvement with Peridia, because like we see them on Cetos here. Yeah, so Hoi Yang there's gonna be says a lot that, like, to say the, about the Purgle. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot to say about those goddamn space whales. But like, Hoi Yang says that the old parts of Peridia were following the uh, migration routes of the Purgle. Migration so the reason paths. why the map... Yeah. Yeah. So the reason why, and I think it's, I'm, in a way I'm glad that this was a connective tissue that was drawn, even though it's paid off in the worst possible way. Um, this explains the, you know, earlier in our last two, in our stream, I was like, there's a huge coincidence that like the map from this other galaxy that these explorers from another galaxy used to get here just so happens to also be the same place that the Purgle migrates to, to and from. Um, now it turns out that like the explorers were following the Purgle, so at least there's some connective tissue there. Um, it's mm-hmm. going to be paid off terribly, something- but it's there. It's something I questioned the logistics of because I was like, how do you track the migration patterns of the Purgle, especially to other galaxies? But apparently, according to episode six, the Night Sisters just like. Uh, oh, yeah, the Peridians are Night Sisters, by the way. They just got in their mouths, I guess. They did the Ahsoka thing. Yeah, uh, the, spoilers for episode fucking six. The, the, the Peridians are fucking Night Sisters. The Night Sisters are from another galaxy and they came to this galaxy and like became. You know, they like they settled on Dathomir and built temples in various places. Um, that does also just mean, and this isn't necessarily a criticism as well as as much as just like a fun fact, uh, that Darth Maul is part of a species that's not from the main galaxy. Cool, cool. Yeah, it makes total sense. Fuck this show. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. there's things to say when we get there. Yeah. When we get there, when we get there. That's it's, my endless, it's my endless... It's my endless mantra, my refrain is when we get there. Yeah, like, the newest episode like actually really killed my night last night. I watched that, I left, and I was just like, I need to watch videos of like just like Disney theme parks just to put myself in some feeling of zen, you know? Just like, oh yeah. Sam Montgomery, thanks for the super chat. Five pounds. I'm going to say it. Can we go back to Mando season one quality? Flawed as hell, but still it at least tried. Uh, it felt like Favreau had a story to tell and prove himself. Man. Well, up to a point. At this point, I'd point. settle for Mando season the, the one. The tracking quality. fobs alone kind of fuck everything up. Yeah, yeah, the fobs are not good. But at least, the thing, at least, the thing Mando I keep saying do... to people is that, like, if we could, if we could get a show that's even half as good as Andor, and that just be the norm going forward, like, we'd be in an okay place. We'd be in a pretty good place. Well, that's the thing. I think everyone forgets how bad Star Wars is by seeing everything else around each show being terrible. So if you have a row of just ten garbage shows your expectations are going to be through the floor. So you're just going to think they're, you know, what the kids call mid. Um, but in reality, mm-hmm. no, they're just all shit. When I see Andor, I see that very clearly in front of my eyes. Oh, shit, here's something that's actually good. This makes everything else look infinitely worse. Well, it's, we're, we're at the point now where I'm like, I, you know, it's not even I want things to be Rogue One quality because they wish they could be Rogue One quality. But like even something that's just like, that's just like Solo. <laughs> like Solo is, Solo is bad, but at least it's not this. Right. Yep, and Solo is also my guilty pleasure too. Like, I'd actually really like if something was like yeah. Solo. I'd uh, like if something had the feel and aesthetic of Solo, but with actual good cinematography and brightness and um, good writing. So true. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that cast. Hey, I, 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 I do really love the like the summer blockbuster fun sort of adventure feel of a, exactly. of a heist movie about Han Solo. Like, that's so fun. We're Give me more of that. missing that in Star Wars. Star well, Wars I mean, Chief, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember Solo, but at the end, there's a Peridian. I'm gonna kill you. Oh my God, <laughs> kill me! I, that's it. I'm fucking. I'm. I'm done. You guys can finish the stream. <laughs> I'm gonna fucking destroy the UK. We've. we've <laughs> that's fine, man. I'm French. I don't give a shit. Yeah, we've lost. Uh, we've, we've lost Chief. I destroyed him. Um. <laughs> hello, hello. Palpatine returned. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, Palpatine returned. You know, to cheat to cheat death is a power that only one has achieved. You know, except for Marek and Ahsoka three times, and except every single zombie the stormtrooper. Night Sisters just in general, yeah, just not. Yeah, just. Oh my god, we'll we'll get there. 
when we get there. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Ray, I am indeed French. Just unfortunately. <laughs> Technically, I'm French too, but through weird All right. shenanigans. So we, we have powered through the, the, the easy episode, the one that was like just kind of whatever. Now we got episode four. Oh boy. Um, so yeah, basically what's going on now is uh, uh, Huyang's still trying to repair the ship. Um, but I think they've decided that the main priority needs to be sending a message out to Hera question mark. That's, that's what they said. Yeah. That's that, that's, that's the biggest um, priority. We also get that, that line from the trailer about Thrawn returning his heir to the empire, which just fuck you sincerely. And and from the bottom of my heart, fuck you. Um, I don't even want to know what Tim- Timothy just, Zorn thinks of all, all this. Oh, that didn't piss me off nearly as I, much as the galaxy far, far away. You know what's line. funny? I wanted to rip my eyes out of my head when I heard that. You know what's funny, Jolly? Um, the what? They've been saying for years that Timothy Zahn was consulted about um, like when, when the show was made, um, which I don't believe, obviously, because they don't fucking reference that at all, like his books and like the conflict therein and the ascendancy and the grisk. But even putting that aside, in the newest episode, I think, um, Thrawn doesn't seem to know who Ahsoka's master was. He doesn't seem to have any idea who Anakin was, even though in the, the canon Thrawn books, Thrawn and Anakin knew each other and worked together during the Clone Wars at one point. Um, they yeah. went to like he knows Anakin they pretty well. Milk. They won on Rise of the Resistance. Yeah. They built lightsabers. Like they even got like they got they got like <laughs> you know Jar Jar and Ahsoka plushies and everything. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, no, he knows Anakin probably better than any other Jedi that existed at the time, except for, like... No, that's it. No, it's it, it really is that. Like, maybe Kanan, but, like, that's it. Oh, dear. He also he also knows Balin as General Balin Skull. Skull. Which means that he well, probably I guess... knows a great deal about a lot of the Jedi generals, which means that he would know about his, uh, Anakin, and by extension, by Ahsoka. He would know about yeah, her. He should... He should definitely know about that. If he's, if he's memorized like the the list of Jedi generals, which I mean, like, god damn, man, that's like thousands of them. But well, whatever. Like, I guess he's just got a really good memory. <laughs> Apparently, it's selective. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's plot selective. Um, f- funny, just a funny mm-hmm. thing before we start on like the main the main stuff is uh, a little note about the dialogue. Like, obviously, like, we, we mentioned this about, like, in our first stream of, like, the dialogue is very prequel-esque. It's, like, very wooden and functional and, and, and badly directed and a bit, like, st- st- uh, inhuman, a bit robotic. Um, but one of the really funny elements of that is when when he tries to break out of that mold, when Dave Filoni tries to write what he considers to be, like, witty repartee, and this is particularly funny between Balin and Morgan, because what keeps happening is that Morgan will ask him like a sarcastic question, like a sassy question that's meant like mocking him, and he'll respond with a one-word answer. Mm-hmm. And it's happened like six or seven times now as of episode <laughs> six. It's really annoying. <laughs> no, you know, my I was like, favorite... oh. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say my favorite dialogue, uh, my favorite line of dialogue in this entire show is, you look old. <laughs> yeah, you look old. Oh, fuck off. Poor oh, opinion. I cannot wait to get to episodes five and six. It's going to be so oh, much fun. Be, you better do it on a day. You I better be felt, doing it on a day where I'm free, man. I'm joining that. I'm, I just oh, felt so, I'm so sorry. I just felt so C. bad for Hayden. I am so sorry. See, Jolly and I have already determined we'll be doing it this Sunday. Fuck you. Sorry. Just but yeah, freaking like, call into work or whatever the fuck. Come and join us. Fuck no. I, I, I want money. Your hatred. All right, Sheev, do you want to fucking give me hundreds of bucks for the day? No. Uh, sorry, give me, a, give me a second, guys. Yeah. Jolly has abandoned us. Um, I don't suppose we could just yeah, continue on uh, without him, but one of the points that I was going to make, I did want to see if he might have any pushback back. again. So it was basically just going to be, he's back. Sorry, my oh, flatmate man. has been very kind felt and so delivering dark and cold. <laughs> My flatmate has been kind and delivering me food, so I just I was saying hello to them. Oh, what a nice guy! What a what a chill dude! <laughs> what a good guy! What a good guy he uh, is! <laughs> so yeah, uh, the the next point that I wanted to make, I wanted to see if maybe you you like you or C could push back against it, uh, which is that I really don't understand why Thrawn coming back is actually that big a deal in terms of just like what Ahsoka and Sabine seem to know, um, like. 
Yeah, he's really smart, and the Empire would benefit from having him, but only if they have the resources to carry out his plans effectively. If they do have those resources, then surely Thrawn coming back would just be the cherry on top, but, like, they could still use those resources to basically win back the galaxy, right? I suppose... The, I'm going to try and make good faith of them as I can be here. I guess the idea is, like... You know, once once the Empire was decapitated, because this is the thing, right? Once Return of the Jedi happened, once the Empire was decapitated of its leadership, um, because it because it was so centralized, because the Moffs were really bad at playing well with each other and were basically just functioning in a cohesive unit because of the force of you know Palpatine. Once he's gone, the war effort just fell to pieces, right? Like everyone's doing their own thing. Infighting was rife, and so like that internal confusion is probably like the largest part of why the Rebellion managed to win in the end, right? Because the Empire would still have had way more resources than them. But they're just, like, splintered and not mm -hmm. using it properly. So I guess the idea with Thrawn is, like, and Thrawn is so brilliant and so uh, good at, at corralling people under his leadership that he represents the only real chance of, like, unifying these remnants into an actual fighting force that could wage war again. And that presents... Even that's, though that's I don't thing, actually like understand... I don't actually understand why anyone, like the Shadow Council or anyone who has any say in how the Empire is is like gonna function going forward, would even listen to Thrawn. Because the thing is, he only had his position of power because Palpatine like valued him and uh, like put him to work, um, and like because Palpatine deemed it okay that that a non-human got to be a Grand Admiral, it became so. But without Palpatine to back him, I don't know how the fuck any one's going to listen to Thrawn or try to follow him or like decide that he gets to be our leader going forward. Um, yeah, that's the I don't problem, really believe that. that. Um, yeah, that's the problem. Is like, from a military perspective, like, yeah, a central leadership of Thrawn with the strategies, you know, Thrawn guiding the strategies, that's a legitimately like, dangerous threat. The problem is, given what we know about the racial policies of the Empire and the Imperial Remnants, and given what we've seen in Mando Season 3 about the Shadow Council and how it operates, and like the tendency of them to ignore Thrawn, even when he's vaguely, in theory, there, um, I don't see how he's going to successfully unify them. So unless they pull out, and they, you know they will do this, they're going to pull out some magical bullshit. Like, oh, he's going to resurrect legions of the dead via Night Sisters and become the Night King. Um, <laughs> oh, fuck this show, by the way. If I ever oh, yeah, this show so fucking show. much. Fuck this show and fuck Baloney. I'm so everyone tired of Star Wars. Wars. No, Why like I, I just stop? I gave up on Star Wars a long time ago. And this is like further cementing. In the galaxy far, far shit. away. I'm going to kill you, Hugh. I mean, Chief. <laughs> Chief yeah, Yang. No, fuck the show. Fuck Filoni. Fuck Lucas. Oh, God. That's cursed. I'll just make that edit later. David Don't Tennant. worry about it. You need to just get David Tennant to narrate I'm... your videos instead. <laughs> that would make them so much better. That would make them well, so yeah. much better. I'm, I'm doing well, as we all know, As we all know, Chief, Ho Yang was given to the Jedi by the Doctor. Bro. <laughs> oh yeah. It's... Apparently in the book Brotherhood, it said that like there's some kind of ancient rumor that the that Hu Yang just was delivered to the Jedi in a blue box. Like what the fuck? Oh fuck off. I get it. Oh, You're yeah. trying to be cheeky or whatever, but like here's the thing. The canon books have ref like canonically have referenced Spock and Kirk. So like I wouldn't put it past them. Here's actually another funny thing too. Um, My friend George was pointing out that um Apparently, there's an action figure for Hugh Yang, and it refers to him as uh, uh, Professor Hugh Yang, which, of course, Professor is often uh, another word, you know, meaning the same thing as Doctor. Doctor Hugh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, Andrew. Um, in From a Certain Point of View, Empire Strikes Back, we get an excerpt that's about the wills uh, discussing the, like, the telling of the story and like it's sort of supposed to be like a cheeky thing where like one of the wills is writing it and he's writing the title crawl um of empire strikes back and um like another will is telling him like oh you're omitting all this information what about this thing what about this thing and he's like i'm just talking about what's in this specific story don't worry about it and and at one point in this story they're like uh they mentioned kirk and spock it happens they are now canonical figures in star wars I want to die. Or like that are at least known about in some kind of meta level. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's uh, just fucking why? <laughs> That's the question. Like, anytime this happens, right, my immediate <laughs> reaction is like, but why? Why have you done this? I don't typically put text in my thumbnails for like my sort of more like unhinged rage videos, but like I think I might just put like that image that I already have picked out for my thumbnail, the one of Ahsoka smiling. 
I might just put like Y written in big text in front of her. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a Y wing. That's my terrible pun for the day. I'm out. <laughs> Nobody knows what a Y wing is, Jolly. Oh, that's true. You know, everyone's always asking why wing. No one's ever asking how wing. Oh my god. Who <laughs> Yang? Professor Hugh. Um Good old. but yeah, like back to the point, like at least because the thing is, like, you know, Ahsoka and Sabine are having this conversation, right? Like, uh, we might have to sacrifice the map because we don't want to risk Thrawn coming back. And it's like, you know, he is just a guy, right? Like, can't you just kill him if you do end up getting like if he ends up does like coming back, you know? I, I don't yeah. know. Well, I mean, like he, Star Wars he, Rebels. It's, it's not like fight. he's like some uber powerful, like Sith Lord character or whatever the fuck. Like him returning would be like Palpatine levels of oh shit, we're screwed. You know, he doesn't yeah, have a Death Star like, at his back. We thought. Well, I mean, the other funny thing is that you know, because because of, of the canon, if Thrawn came back with like Night Sister Zombie Army, Palpatine would just turn up with his fleet of Star Destro Death Star destroyers and be like, "So you're working for me, aren't you?" Because if not, I'm gonna kill you. Um, I just. Oh man, I yeah, hate. It's, it's, I hate post Return of the Jedi canon. Yeah, it's terrible. The thing is, like in terms of like Thrawn's use, effectiveness, plot relevance, all of the above, we've seen him in action in in, in his prime, quote unquote, in Rebels, when he had the entire resources of an empire at his disposal, and uh, he was defeated by some whales. So <laughs> he was defeated by a, like a seventeen-year-old kid. And some, and some whales. whales, yeah. Like, so don't, you know, forgive me, I'm not that He's just insulted the macaroni threat. and cheese recipe of a whale. <laughs> <laughs> I understood that reference. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, so, so it's, it is that thing of just like, I, I, you, you, can, you can build him up to be this big bad all you want, but like, Va Darth Vader, he is not. Darth Sidious, he is not. Darth Revan, he is not. You know, like, this man is dangerous, don't get me wrong, but like, he is in relative terms, fairly low down on the risk of problems that the New Republic could be facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, like, if 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 if, the, if his entire claim to being a threat is that he's really smart and tactically genius, uh, Episode 6 fucks with that anyway, so oh well. Yep. Thrawn is well, a fucking a... idiot in the newest episode. Well, I guess uh, Thrawn kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. Thrawn kind of forgot about how basic sensor scanners work and how to find Ezra. Thrawn, Thrawn yeah, Thrawn just forgot about how the hermit crab people work. <laughs> Thrawn could have Tie Fighters at its disposal and could easily have uh, stormtroopers flying around the planet. Oh my god, they are Koopa Troopers! Jesus Christ, they are Koopa Ooh. Troopers! Yeah, Dave Filoni have an original idea I'm challenge surprised. level impossible. <laughs> Yeah, I was just gonna say, no, I'm surprised he didn't just pull another random uh, species from like Treasure Planet or something. Since that's all, like, so much of his work is just ripping from Treasure Planet and Alien. Uh, sorry, Aliens rather. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, I was, I was, yeah. I was uh, we're jumping ahead episodes, but like when they first arrive at Peridia and it's like you know descending through like what it looks like you know to a, a place that kind of looks like Iceland and it's like lots of mist and like and and like large empty like damaged statues. I was like, wow, Prometheus much? I was is thinking just... more Dune. Mm -hmm. well, it's, yeah, it's just like Alien Covenant, Prometheus. Like, Is that kind of like, oh, it's the Don't abandoned planet? Dune. Of... Forerunner species. Yeah, God, yeah. Just Anyway, anyway, back to the episode. With <laughs> Do Dune not away. fucking compare this to Dune. No, no, I'm not comparing <laughs> this to Dune in any positive sense. I'm saying the phone probably knocked <laughs> off Dune. I was thinking of the uh, fucking yeah. the, the one place where the where you have the guy at this top of the body. Well, didn't he kind of already do that there. with the crate dragon fight in Mando season two? Or oh, that was John Favreau technically, but he was, that involved. was Favreau. It, Filoni's always involved with this shit. He's the head of the story group. Anyway, anyway, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Sabine is nervous, and so Ahsoka's like, "Oh, you know, you need to calm down and chill, and 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 can I rely on you? I can rely on you, right? I can definitely trust you. This is definitely not foreshadowing for a really stupid character moment. They're like really setting up, like like all this shit is like, hey, don't fuck up. That you stay together, work together. Yeah, I can rely on this Sabine. Is, this is less a this is it's less like, a I telegraph. Wonder if they're gonna get separated. This is less a telegraph and more like a giant." catastrophically large bonfire complete with fireworks, sparklers, children dancing and a hog roast. I just, it's bonkers. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so we have this like, oh, Sabine, you're definitely not going to do anything shady, are you? Are you? And she's like, no, of course not. And uh, mm -hmm. anyway, Hoi Yang, meanwhile, is ambushed outside by 
an assassin robot. And like, I'll be, I'll be good faith here. Well, the reason. Oh, no, go, on. go ahead. No, no, after no, no, please. I want to hear your good faith. No, no, no after you, I insist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say a couple of things. First of all, I don't know why the droids decided to attack before Shin and Maruk could, uh, come, could like reinforce them. Uh, but secondly, I don't know why the droid didn't just shoot Hu Yang. Well, so this is why I'm going to be good faith, no. though, because I think there is an explanation here, which is if you're trying to take Ahsoka and Sabine unawares and you start firing blasters, they're going to hear and run outside. Whereas if you can like creep up behind Hu Yang and quietly take them out, you have a better chance of catching them unawares. So like the thing is that I originally gave it that, too, but then I was actually watching it and like they couldn't hear all the commotion that was happening outside, despite the fact that two like metal robots were punching each other um, right outside the ship. So, like, well, I don't that's know. The interest. I don't well, think you know, that she... a blaster shot would have been <clears throat> that much louder. Well, the, the thing is, you know, Sheev, is uh, uh, Togruta's eardrums are very selective about the sounds they, they hear and don't <laughs> hear. It turns out that Rock'em Sock'em Robot is just absolutely silent to Ahsoka, but, um, but you know, a blaster bolt, she'd hear that. <laughs> Yeah, well, but either way, they attack, and, um, but again, do you have a defense for why they didn't wait for Shin and Merrick to get there? I'm nope. just going to call him Merrick. I'm, not, I'm tired of trying to say Maroc. I always forget it, how it's pronounced. Matt. Eric. This happened to my buddy Merrick. Michael. Sam Whitwell. Samuel. His name's Michael. He's just, he's just Michael. Starkiller. <laughs> Can't believe people were thinking Starkiller would be fucking canonized this show. What a bunch of fucking more. Honestly, at this point, I was saying I'm this so to glad he Honestly, wasn't. At this point, though, there's nothing they could do that would surprise me. Like, if, if, if you know, the World Between World episode had been Ahsoka went into the Illuminati headquarters from Multiverse of Madness and met Patrick Stewart, <laughs> I wouldn't have even blinked an eye. I'm like, yeah, fuck it, why not? Anything, anything. Winnie the Pooh could have turned up, and I wouldn't have been surprised. In Filoni's Star Wars, I, think I remember I mean, my I was like saying any thing, so. after episode four. I think I remember saying after episode four that my new catchphrase for this show going forward was just going to be, you might as well at this point. Yeah. Like, Ahsoka, why the fuck not? <laughs> oh, um, God. Yeah. So, so the, also, the ambush so, happens. So the, then, yeah, the ambush happens, and then Ahsoka and Sabine are made aware of it and come outside to, to join the fight. Now, I... So I, I criticized the scene originally because Sabine doesn't have her jetpack. But, like, I went back and I looked at the Rebels epilogue, um, which, I mean, it's not like they maintain consistency with that anyway. But, like, she doesn't have it there. Um, why would she not bring her jet back along just to any mission? I don't um, know. Because she's stupid. Because the thing is, she didn't have it at first in, the, in Rebels, but then she earned it, I think, in Season 3. She, like, had... And then for, going forward, she had it and used it for everything. Uh, because why wouldn't you? Why did she not bring it along? I, I don't understand. Because I criticized her not thick. using it during the... I criticized her not using it when she was chasing after the robot and, uh, like, right before engaging with Shin in the lightsaber fight uh, because she could have just grabbed it real quick and then, uh, you know, subverted having to use the elevator at all. She could have just flown over the rail and, like, intercepted him. Uh, I don't I don't understand why she's not using her jetpack. She doesn't have it here, and it'd be very useful, especially when, like, they're trying to get to the ground base and they're running through the woods. Like, you could just pick Ahsoka up and fucking fly her there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just... So much about Sabine doesn't make sense. And we're going to get onto the really big thing, obviously, at the end of this. But... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, on a side note as well, Beskar's back. Because her armor is now impenetrable. Yeah. See, so here's I'm the so thing. People are going to say... People are going to say that Sabine already had impenetrable armor in Rebels. But, like... There were only certain parts of it, right, first of all. Because that's the thing that like people seem to be forgetting, which is that even in Mando season one, Beskar was treated as a very rare thing, quote unquote. And like to to have an entire suit of Beskar was basically unheard of, which is why when Mando did end up getting one, it was like, oh shit, like you're you know, you're the big stuff now. Um, but now it's just a thing that everyone has. Um, I I'm okay with some parts of Sabine's armor, even in Rebels being Beskar. But, like, a lot of it was just Durasteel. And, like, she was still in very real danger during gunfights. Because otherwise, what the fuck are the stakes? There aren't any. It's a short answer. Yeah, pretty much. 
But yeah, so the, I mean, so that's the fight that. goes on. Sorry, after you. Go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. So that was, so that, I, the fight, I wasn't yeah, going to say, any, gonna say anything. I didn't okay. say anything. All right. <laughs> I didn't say anything either. Numbers Calm wire, down, gross. Chief. Oh my god. <laughs> so angry. So dark. You're showing yes. up in the DC universe. Anyway, yeah. So like they win the fight. <laughs> they, they beat all the way over a TV show. Mad. So mad. And and then Hoya is like, yeah, they're off. They're like, oh, we're gonna go track these robots to the the henge. We're gonna go deal with this thing and try and destroy the map if we can. And Ho Yang's like, well, Stay no, you together. two. Stay together. Don't do anything like, you know, like betray one another. That would be really stupid. And they're like, you know, Ho Yang, <laughs> you, you fantasist, you. Yeah, we've got each other's back. And Ho Yang stays to like fix the, um, the radio. Anyway, they all, mm. they all trot off, leaving Ho Yang to fiddle with wires. And uh, <clears throat> in the woods, they and come across the Merrick and Shin. Oh, yeah, we hey, should no, have the no, Hera first. Don't, yeah. don't, don't Hera, she's going to go off on this mission despite the fact that it hasn't been sanctioned. And guess who's coming along? It's Carson Tava. I was actually waiting for the the viewers to guess, but um, well, uh, no, no, I'm not talking I, about I ha- Tava. I, <laughs> I have my own. Oh, you mean, oh. involvement and what that means. For oh, Seb. you mean yeah. someone else is coming along? Someone else will be joining <laughs> her for this little endeavor. Um, well, you must mean you must mean Chopper, surely, because Jason um... Solo. No, <laughs> that's He's not his continuity. name. Jason Solo is like... a good character. No, I mean, Sheev, I mean, you must you must be referring to Chopper, right? Chopper's the one coming with her, because, you know, for her to bring anyone else, and certainly a specific someone, would be so well, who else would she bring? Well, she awful. should bring Zeb. Zeb is a pretty strong and oh, capable I mean, player. Yeah. She could Zeb's bring great. Zeb. Don't know where he is. Um, so she brings Jason along. He was Jason too expensive along. to have in the show. I just, want, I just want to make sure it's very clear. Um, Jason Sindula, the 10-year-old, is coming along, even though Hera knows that some kind of Imperial operation is going on that she believes is linked to Thrawn. Um, and she's taking him to this planet, the not easy being cheesy planet. Um, <laughs> well, so that's fun. She definitely knows. So much for her being worried the, about uh, his safety. Well, yeah. Also, in terms of what she knows is there, she definitely knows that like the mercenaries who single-handedly killed an entire cruiser are there. So... Yep. Let's let's, um, let's bring let's bring Jason to that very child friendly environment. Yeah, and so the thing is, and I, <clears throat> someone actually unironically defended this by saying that we know she brings Jason on her missions because we saw them flying together in the Rebels epilogue, even though we don't know what the context of that flight was. That could have just been her, her taking her son out for a joyride, because you know she's his mom and she wants him to have fun. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were like in in any kind of battle. We've never seen her take her take him on any missions prior to this because why the fuck would she? Um, yeah, I mean she she was on Endor, yeah, so, and as far as we're aware, he wasn't. Yeah, because he why, be. why would he be on Endor? Oh man! Um, the second defense was that child endangerment is a thing in Star Wars that has been done everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, who that's wants good. to address child this? endangerment? We're gonna <laughs> yes, we're gonna use child endangerment as a fucking defense. So so everyone. <laughs> uh, so first of all, this is actually like if if people go like, oh well, children were put in danger in other movies. I'm like, yes, it was a problem there too. So that's not a defense, right? This problem can be happened more than once. Always. Oh yeah, obviously, um, but like because like and it could, obviously it could be like like uh, you're gonna hear me criticize Kenobi relentlessly, but like obviously the fact that Leia is in danger and that she's going along with Obi Wan on all these dangerous missions isn't like a problem uh, contextually because he's trying to rescue her from that. But even the Kenobi series recognizes that a ten year old should not be involved in this sort of thing, even a force sensitive one. Her life was in danger, and that was the entire pr- like premise of the show. Was That's getting her out of that danger, right? Yeah, and like, the and, other two and this show just casually is... has Hera bring her along, like, okay. Because well, this is the thing: the, the two examples that people tend to bring up is like, oh, well, Anakin and Phantom Menace. I'm like, well, first of all, the Phantom Menace example is is, is bullshit. It shouldn't have been allowed. Like, Qui Gon should have left mm-hmm. Anakin in like, uh, in you know, in, ben, in Amidala's apartment on Coruscant. Yeah, <laughs> but like. Even even assuming that like for whatever reason he couldn't do that and he's, he wants to keep an eye on Anakin, he still tried to be like when the battle starts, go and hide. 
don't get involved. Yeah. You know, try try and stay out of it. And then the other example is that the you know the Jedi, you know, Ahsoka was essentially a child soldier. And I'm like, yeah, that's unironically part of what you're supposed to criticize about the Jedi. That's a bad thing. It's used as a bad thing. The Jedi do this. So like the yeah. idea that you point to that and be like, therefore it's okay for her to bring Jason. I'm like, no, absolutely not. Yeah, no, it's bullshit. I remember someone defending it by saying that, like, in the EU, the, uh, like, Han, Leia, and Luke would bring their kids along on dangerous missions a lot. And, like, no. no. Granted, I haven't read all of it. So maybe there's some story out there where, like, Jason and Jaina and Anakin and, and you know, Ben Skywalker when he was a kid, like, were, were like, intentionally and, and purposefully brought on missions that, like, where their lives were threatened. But just from what I've seen... The only time that that ever happens is like uh, in I think Dark Empire. No, in in uh, in the Thrawn trilogy rather, when Leia is still pregnant with uh, Jason and Jaina, um, like there are people specifically trying to kill her and by extension her children, and like obviously she's doing everything she can to keep them safe because obviously, um, anytime that like even as kids they're they're brought on missions that could be potentially dangerous. That's when they're like being trained as Jedi. You know, and their Padawans, which is a completely different thing. Um, and even then, we're talking like 15, 16 years old, not like children. Yeah, because Jason is, I mean, like you said he was 10, but he can't be, because right, he was born a year after um, the end of Rebels. He would have been born around, you hope. no, that was, that would have been around zero BBY. Re the end of Rebels is a year before A New Hope. So yeah, and this is taking place in 9 ABY. Nine. So yeah, he's like nine. So he's he's nine. He's nine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just, Depending on where this is uh, in the timeline, because the, because all these shows either take place in nine ABY over the span of a few months or over several years. Um, he's take your he's pick, only about a year. He's only about a year or two older than um. Well, he's about three years older, right, than Ben Solo. <laughs> Jason is either uh, yeah. Jason is anywhere between nine and fifteen years old. <laughs> I just. It's oh, it's all up in the air. Well, he's definitely not fifteen. He's he's yeah. nine. Like he's nine. He's nine years old. Yeah, no, I I I I I'm joking. He's obviously not any older than nine or ten. Oh God, it's all so depressing. Yeah. So like the, the point the point of all this is like Hera has been thoroughly assassinated because if there's one thing we knew about Hera based in Rebels is that she is very much the mother of that crew. She does not like placing any of them, oh. including the adults, into danger unnecessarily. Yeah, you just actually reminded me the other defense for this has been that like Hera is no stranger to endangering children because Ezra and Sabine were kids back when they ran together during the rebellion days. And it's like, and do you think that she would have done that if there was any other choice? Well, let's examine that, right? So uh, of the two children on board, and like both of them are older, by the way, than Jason is. Because Ezra's what, like 12 yeah. at the start of Rebels? Um, or 13? 14. Um, oh, 14. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like nearly nearly 14 old and to be like, is 16 so like yeah N yeah she's, function she's functioning in adults there. and like and the circumstances of that is like sabine is on the run after you know because she's a deserter she's an imperial deserter mm -hmm. so like she's on like arrest lists and like she's in danger of being like kidnapped and used as a political prisoner against her family or even executed um if she's ever caught so she's got no choice but to be in this fight and the same is kind of true for Ezra, who's a street kid, who his own parents are political prisoners, and as far as he knows, dead um, at the hands of the Empire, mm -hmm. and who is a, a petty criminal. Like, and and then he gets involved with Jedi, you know, accidentally, but gets involved with Jedi. He he's he's like he can't fit back into society. He can't be left anywhere safe. Like, he's never going to be safe. So like the yeah. best thing for him also also because he's force sensitive. So the best thing for him is to stay with them. exactly yeah so like yes they go on missions yes sometimes the kids are put in danger the contexts are completely different and that's that's why i brought up context that's you guys have to like pay attention to context you can't just ignore it for the sake of making a point no nah, it makes it easier to just ignore issues no nah, yeah just if, kid was in danger in this show so kid in danger in this show is now fine and it's like you realize I'm not actually criticizing the fact that a child was in danger, period. I'm criticizing why it happened and like how it was allowed to happen and what adults made what decisions in order to make it happen. And what that says about them, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, I guess Hera never really cared for Jason, innocent or otherwise. 
That's oh fuck yeah. off, Jolly. Don't do that shit to me. I don't want to hear. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying. That, that exact again. thing, fuck right? You. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. That right is that like we've got a moment coming up with Sabine where I get to co- get to use that quote again very <laughs> very soon. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that's that. Show. Hera's bringing Jason along. Um, and yeah, Teva's also coming along, but not Zeb, because he's either not at a Delphi base yet, or is or on some mission, he or he's too or expensive he's to be CG'd expensive. into every yeah. scene. Yeah. It's just well, like, I mean, he in uni- involved. Come on. That's the thing, in-universe, I'm guessing that, like, because like, even if he's somewhere else, right, because the thing is, te- Carson's come all the way from a Delphi base, which is quite a long way away. It's on the outskirts of the galaxy, right? As, for, for, as we know from mm-hmm. Mando. So, unless this is by a huge coincidence just happening right next door to him, which, like, fuck off at that point. Um, he's <laughs> had to come a long way to be here, which means that Zeb could have been here as well. Like, he could have come here too. So I guess in universe, Zeb just told the hero to shove it. Well, and here's the <laughs> thing too, is like, if the Even effects though are too expensive Sabine... to do... Go ahead. Sabine is, like, involved, and, like, this is this involves maybe potentially getting Ezra back. Like, no... Zeb would be Zeb would be involved. I'm sorry. Fuck you. Don't tell me he wouldn't. Yeah, especially if Hera's organizing a you know because that's what she is. She's organizing a mutiny. You're gonna want every loyal guy on your side that you can scrounge. This is to stop Thrawn. You're mm-hmm. contacting everyone. Frankly, it's amazing that Luke isn't it's... here, but we'll talk about that too. <laughs> yeah, I was, just, I was yeah. just gonna say like it's what really is happening is that Zeb and Luke are on some kind of like no phones vacation out in the fucking boonies, like in the Rocky <laughs> Mountains. And... They don't have cell service up there. They're Zeb trying to and Luke detox the... from social media. No, Zeb and Luke are doing the galactic equivalent of Brokeback Mountain. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're just they're just out camping in the wilderness, making very odd looks at each other. <laughs> yes, Callus would be there too because he's yeah, with absolutely. Zeb. Of course, yeah. Callus is a good person. He cares about Ezra. He would want to get him back. He would be there too. Well, yeah. I guess Callus. I guess Callus could be dead because we've had no confirmation of whether he survived the war. Uh, but... Well, no, he survived the war. Did he? Do we know yeah. that? We he went back to. Uh, I mean, we know that he. Yeah, that happened after. Oh yeah, he did. Jedi, I'm pretty sure. Well, I guess now, he, he could survived. still be there, right? But yeah, he uh, could I was be. gonna say if the effects, like if the meta reason for him not being there is the effects are too expensive, then uh, maybe you should do this in animation because it makes sense for the character to yeah. be there and thus makes it so it needs to be in or animation. The, or at the very scared. least, at the very least, write in a reason why he's not here. Right. Like, just have yep. fucking minimum. Have, have a throwaway line, anything. Yeah, I take I take like a really bullshit excuse rather than no excuse at all. Well, I, I, yeah, that's the thing. Like, even if they even if they're fucking it up, I'd rather they tried than just not bothered. Yeah, I'll take I'll take bad work over sheer laziness any day. Yeah, no, exactly. That's why, like, I was watching Rogue One the other day with Sheev after watching uh, Andor, and I was like, no, this movie is really bad. But I I still enjoy it. Eh. I still appreciate what it did. Yeah, I like Rogue One. It's got, it, it, does a lot, it does a lot right. I wouldn't call it bad. No, yeah, I'd say it it's bad. mediocre. It's a it's a five, I think, or a, maybe a four and a half. It's not it's not terrible. I had yeah, yeah I had it at a five movie. before we watched the movie. I've <laughs> dropped it to like a four, but like that's as low as I'm going. But yeah, that's. Back to back to the episode. So they're in the woods, and uh, wow, it's it's Shin and Marek are there to engage them in a fight. Yeah, just uh, I mean, sh- of all the so like all, of all the paths to get between the two locations, I guess they they decided to just take the same path. Uh, they it's like a, it's like a woodland trail. I mean, maybe there doesn't seem to be any kind of trail. That's the thing. No, no, I mean it's just it's just like a uh, nature reserve, right? Where they just like have a woodland trail, like a big like a big wooden map board, being like <laughs> go this way. <laughs> all the different like uh touristy spots and stuff like oh yeah, yeah look at this fancy looking rock here you know don't rock, st- don't stray base rock don't stray from the path in case you wake up the hibernating bears tk9851 also i see tk that anyway you in the chat and yet not on the stream you are uh, miserable backstabbing yeah get light. your ass <laughs> in here i put you in the title and everything coward do you would, you, would you make me a liar shit. As well as a grifter? Wait. That's... <laughs> I... Well, he admits it. Oh, also, like, and this is a thing that Ahsoka does twice in this episode. She gets into two different lightsaber duels and never decides to use both of her blades. I, I don't understand. Yeah, she's just... For... Well, you know, she kind of forgot about the uh, second blade. 
that's like the style that she's been training with since she was a teenager. That like would that not be her most proficient lightsaber style that she would use? Sheev, I've already explained. She kind of forgot about her second blade. Oh, that's, no, that's you're the, right. You're right. You're right. You're right. My bad. Yeah, you see, they they explained it. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> that's that, that's um, my fault. Yeah. Yeah. So Shin fights um Shin fights uh Sabine. And there's some very funny things that go on there because, like, Sabine obviously has ranged weapons. She's got guns, and so she mm-hmm. shoots at Shin. Shin runs away, like as you should, because you know it's either that or just hold your ground indefinitely. And Shin is trying to draw her into a trap. But Sabine, trained warrior Sabine, decides to close the distance. <laughs> <laughs> Stop! Yeah, she wants to engage in a lightsaber fight with someone she's already failed in a lightsaber fight against. Um, yeah, catastrophically, she got okay. like, mortally wounded. Well, ostensibly. Yeah. I, uh... Maybe maybe after what happened last time, she figured if she got stabbed again, she would just like recover in 20 minutes. So she'd be okay. She'd just walk it off. <laughs> she's like slaps him back. She gets stabbed and right through the there. forehead. No, she gets stabbed in the fucking forehead and she's like, ow! And it like heals. She's like, say, she's like dirge. Are... <laughs> in America, do you guys have Kelpol? I've never heard of that, no. Oh, okay. So Calpol is like, do you know what paracetamol? No, you guys have paracetamol, right? Like, I'm, nope, I mean, you will, you will do. You, you, you'll, you'll call it by a different name. I don't know what you call it in the states. Aspirin, maybe. But anyway, like, yeah, the yeah. So Calpol is like liquid aspirin for for children. Like, it's, it's it's a thing you give to children when they're too small for pills, right? So it's like it's like a very pink, sugary liquid. And you can also get it in banana oh, flavor. It's fucking delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had that. Yeah, I remember as a kid. I, yeah, my, my, that, my mom that was, would give me that. That was absolute top 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 notch crack. And like, forget selling drugs in clubs. Just sell me that Calpol, man. I'll have that. <laughs> but like, I like the idea that like, not even back to right. Like, Sabine gets like st- like gets cut in half or like cut cut into pieces, and she just like reaches into a box and pulls out like a bottle of Calpol, and she's like, "I'll be fine. Let's go." <laughs> but yeah, while that's going on, yeah. uh, Ahsoka is with one hand tied behind her back, met- metaphorically, taking on Marek. Um. And this is a very silly and, fight, uh, a very bad choreography. Yeah. But, um... I mean, well, I, Sheev, I, I, you, I just immediately want to skip to the part where she uh, she kills him. Uh, which, first of all, just to, just as a, an aside, like, the way in which it happens, he's doing that thing that the Inquisitors can do with, like, the spinny lightsabers, which, I mean, looks really goofy, but from a practical standpoint, it's like a pretty good defense, right? Because like, there's no way to, to penetrate that without going uh, like in the middle, I guess. What like Kanan did, which isn't what that's not what she does. Um, she she kind of just slashes at his side, and somehow her lightsaber goes through his defense. His helicopter and it turns out defense. He's a bag of I don't. Farts and he just explodes. Wait, yes, we're not there yet. Spoilers. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, so she Didn't kills him. Spoil that he's a fart. And, and and like initially the thing was like, I mean, and I remember saying this in the last stream that like apparently everyone had some had some like hyped up idea of what he's supposed to be and like he's gonna be like this this mystery character and there'd, there'd be like some kind of reveal. No, he just died. And I was like, oh, that's hilarious. But then yeah, so then he erupts into some kind of gaseous form, and with like a uh, ring like, like screen as well shoots out from his body and he died <laughs> well um there's two ways you can interpret this either and i'm gonna go with the i guess better alternative first he, he had like the savage treatment which is that he's not innately that force sensitive or whatever um or you know anything like that but then like the night sisters imbued him with power and once it died it faded from him kind of like with savage the issue with that is like they like when it happened with Savage, he was bulked out, uh, turned into a fucking Hulk. Now, like originally, he was already pretty fit, pretty buff, pretty muscular, but like it, like he was turned into an actual fucking Hulk by the the spell. So like, unless we're going like with a with like a Steve Rogers thing where Merrick was just like a really scrawny, tiny dude, and then like this is his hulked out form, this like average looking guy. Uh, I don't think this is supposed to be Savage. I think we're actually saying he's a Night Sister zombie, which um, you know, that breaks everything. So just throw that on yeah. the fire of world breaking comics. <clears throat> so I want to because I, um, I think this needs um this needs a bit of explanation, right, for why it's so world breaking. So obviously in the Clone Wars we've had Night Sister zombies before. Oh, okay. All right, uh, I'll, I'll, sh- I'll shut the fuck up then. 
<laughs> yeah, I was gonna. This is my. I thought this was my. This was my moment to talk about the fucking the Merrick shit because I've been ranting about this weeks. To <laughs> well, listen, then, now I get to the, say it on the screen. spotlight. The spotlight is all yours, Sheev. I, I will be silent. <laughs> Narcissist. So you, <laughs> most of you guys know, uh, probably anyway, that I've been working on a Clone Wars video for some time now. I don't think it's a very well written show. Um. That being said, the Night Sister zombies in the in the arc or the episode rather where Grievous attacks Dathomir and kill, and wipes out the Night Sisters, the Night Sister zombies are a thing, and I don't think they're cool. I don't think they're good. I don't like that they are, they, they exist in the world. But at the very least, they were zombies. They were like you know reanimated corpses being puppeteered by a witch. They they weren't like their own people with agency and like the ability to, to, to talk and understand and think and all of that and walk around. And, you know, like it wasn't like that. They were still zombies. Merrick can talk. Merrick can understand and, things like verbally, like he's a, he's a functioning person for all intents and purposes, which essentially means that this goes beyond a re this goes beyond necromancy. This is actual resurrection. Death stopped meaning anything for night sisters at this point. Well, Sheev, to cheat death is a power um, only one has achieved. <laughs> Except for this person and this person and this person and this. You know, the frustrating impermanence of character deaths. It just because that video just continues to age like fine wine. It's it's also oh, weird because they're like, oh no, Merrick is dead. And it's like, no, just reanimate him. Why yeah, he'll be, why not? He'll be back. And in great now, there is an alternative. Uh, there is an alternative situation for Merrick, and it's that he just had too much uh, Taco Bell, you know. Yeah, he, he had a really, gas. a really large curry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when did he talk? Uh, Shin gave him uh, an order, I guess, during the dog fight, and he said, "As you wish." That's why we set yeah. that up earlier <sighs> in the stream. He can talk. I, d I didn't mention this yet. Not only can he talk, but like the, his retrieval of his lightsaber on Karate means he can also use the Force. So mm. we have, uh -oh. we yeah, have the night zombies can use the force. <laughs> yeah, so like I don't know what Palpatine was doing, fucking around with like clone bodies. When apparently the night sisters can just resurrect from the actual dead, fully cognizant, fully lightsaber trained, fully force wielding space liches. Like, man, oh wow, no one's ever really gone. I am so fucking tired. I, I don't even know anymore, man. <laughs> And what's funny is that we're not even at the worst stuff yet. Like, not even close to the worst stuff that this <laughs> series has done. Well, this is what I keep saying is that they keep introducing new world-breaking shit to the point where stuff like the Night Sister zombies, fuck it, that's that doesn't even matter anymore. Fuck that. Anyone can be force sensitive. Yeah, okay, whatever. It just keeps getting worse. Yeah, it's 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 slightly odd. And by slightly odd, I mean uh, absolutely com fucking incomprehensible. But anyway. Batshit, absolutely batshit. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's so the thing that next? happens. Oh, it's Shin, Shin oh, fighting. So, yeah, so with Merrick dead, Sabine and uh, and Shin are still fighting, and Sabine's like, like looks over at Ahsoka, and she's like, "Go, go on ahead. I got this." Um, no, no, you, you, you don't got this. The last time that yeah, you were yeah. in a lightsaber duel with this person, you fucking got stabbed. Why would Ahsoka run off and leave her to fight? Like. Surely Ahsoka would see it as like even if it takes a little more time to get to the Stonehenge, surely she would see it as opportune to make sure that both she and Sabine are there when it comes to like getting to the map because like you don't know what kind of defenses are going to be there. They know Balin is a character who exists. We don't know how powerful he is, um, you know. And also there's there's just the simple fact of like you know Sabine will die. Um, like if if you leave her alone, because that's what happened last time. Like she got almost killed. So like, no, I don't believe that Ahsoka would just leave, like to, like yeah. and not just help her with the fight real quick. I don't understand that. Well, again, someone pointed that out in the, in the <clears throat> chat, and I'll bring it up because it does. It comes up later in the episode as well. Shin could just force choke out Sabine at any moment. Sabine has no way of deflecting that. In fact, Shin does do that later in the episode. Yeah. So it's perfectly within Shin's capabilities just to end the fight in five milliseconds after Ahsoka's left. Also, just to add this too, it is kind of in character for Ahsoka to leave uh, Sabine there because she's also very clearly at this point established being negligent as shit. She's <laughs> really fucking dumb. 
Yeah, it's 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 within oh, it's within her new TK. character. Oh, yeah, it's Captain Enoch, and he's a he's a night trooper. That's not Enoch. That's Ew. just a random. Uh, I oh, like yeah. the trooper design. Is is my microphone quality yeah. good by any chance? Yeah, it's yeah, good. It coming through a little loud on my end. I don't know if that's just me though. Yeah, same. Uh, Sheev can turn me down just that in seems case. Seems like then. a skill issue. Well, Sheev certainly yeah, can't can. turn you on. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going there. <laughs> no, like, um, yeah, no, like, well, uh, I, wait, I wait, so, wait, so what? What, the, what the part night, are we the at? Zombie, the, the zombie stormtroopers are stupid, but like. That, that is a pretty I, cool looking stormtrooper design. I'll give it that. I do like the design, yeah, but Enoch looks stupid and I hate him. Enoch looks like a ripoff yeah. of the fucking Servant of the Flame from Sea of Thieves, if you guys know what he looks like. <laughs> well, he's, he's just a, he's oh, a sort of a harpy. Here, here's the thing with Enoch. I actually yeah, thought of punching of a, a hole in my wall when I saw him. I'm not even joking. I thought of it. <laughs> Here's the thing about Enoch. It's a it's a cracking book in the Bible. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say right, like the name what is also really stupid. Like it's all just it's it's just I, I I see what you're doing. He's clearly a zombie. The name sounds really dumb too. It just I makes can't me think believe of Jack the Ascoli's were true. Are you a eunuch? Captain Eunuch. <laughs> Captain Eunuch. You a eunuch, are you? Wait, wait, so wait, so which part of the episode are we at right now? So Mar Marek's just exploded. We just got uh, Shin, Shin is fighting um, Sabine. Well, so much for all the rumors yeah. of who he was. Yeah. Oh, I've been over this. He was Perry. Yeah, oh yeah, Perrin. Not oh, Perrin. Oh, Perrin, that's right. No, no, he's Perry. Perry nope. the Math Plus. <laughs> oh, Perry the Pop. Perrin Trant. Oh, okay. Perrin Trant. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny that Phineas and Ferb Star Wars Andor and Andor, Andor are like the only are like the only good Star Wars thing Disney has made. Uh, Galaxy's Edge is pretty fun. Phineas. Is it? Yeah. I love Phineas and Ferb Star Wars. Oh, it's, it's so sure. good. I just like the idea that we're gonna have that with like Marek, where like Marek like is like you know like if see Ahsoka's like a, a, an Inquisitor and like takes off his head mask and it's like Starker. I was like, <gasps> Perry the Inquisitor. <laughs> Wait a minute! No, that's what Darth. <laughs> that's what happened with Darth Schmertz. He became Merrick because he couldn't find he couldn't find a career as a Sith Lord, so he just became whatever the oh fuck. Oh my Merrick god! <laughs> the tragedy. Uh, he he got Darth hit by the Schmerz. Sithinator. When he died, that was Sithinator energy like, no, leaving his body. <laughs> it all makes sense now. It's it's not broken anymore. <laughs> it's a really cool machine. Is evil uh, than Darth Vader's anyway, is evil anyway. greater than, than Darth Vader has ever been. Anyway, back to the episode. So, uh, Ahsoka's run off to go fight Balin. Well, she's about to go fight Balin. And Shin and Sabine are having it out. They're duking it out. And Sabine gets knocked down to the floor because, yeah, obviously she's not going to win this fight. And she flings out her hands to use the Force. And Shin recoils and then realizes that nothing is fucking happening. Because, like, yeah, of course nothing is fucking <laughs> happening. Yeah, there, um, well, there were two interpretations of that moment. It was either that she used like a modicum of force sensitivity, or like that was just like a flinch and like it didn't. Like, oh, nothing what? actually happened. I think it's a flinch. I think it's I, like, I, I didn't like, understand like, that. What was forward. that? I don't understand. What, and what Sheep said. What was that? What are you, is this a bit or no? Like I didn't understand what you said there. Like a what of force sensitivity? A modicum. Like a it like means, a small amount. It means a small amount. Oh, I I didn't know what that meant. I'm dumb. Modicum. <laughs> oh, clearly. Like, you don't know writing. Yeah, I don't know what one uh, word means. So anyway, so yeah, my opinion happened. means nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Get good at English. Kill issue. And then Shin. And then Shin goes. You have no power. You have no power I'm here, like... Gandalf the Grey. <laughs> <laughs> And then she, she starts like, yeah, throwing insults dialogue. back. No, Sabine Shin just starts, takes takes Shin. off her armor, and it's like, uh, I will draw you, Shin, like poison is drawn from a wound. Saruman the stupid. <laughs> Stop that. Saruman, <laughs> Saruman the, the silly. silly. No. <laughs> Saruman the stinky. No! no! <laughs> uh. I can't even remember. Like, Sabine, isn't this like she's tricked Shin in some way? She like uses a dart or a, or a flame. I can't even remember. She, like some kind of gadget yeah, to, to she, defeat like, her. Yeah, she shoots her with like wrist rocket sort of thing, and then like it like makes uh, Shin like recoil and drop her lightsaber. And then it cuts to a different scene. But like right after this, like like Shin like throws a smoke bomb down and disappears like a magician. Why? Just pick up your lightsaber. <laughs> like, okay, Just pick up your lightsaber I... and kill her. 
Just kill her. Yeah. What the fuck is, like, is oh, Sabine realistically gonna do? Also, I just like that. Like, oh no, the lightsaber, the lightsaber has been knocked out of my hand. If only I had a telekinetic ability to pull it back. <laughs> you know, like this, yeah, this is an opportunity to flex on Sabine. Like, look what I can do, and then she pulls it back yeah. to her. Or just chokes her. Just chokes her out straight away there, and just picks up the lightsaber afterwards. Which we know she can mm-hmm. do because she does it later. <laughs> oh. Right, right. Anyway, while yeah. that's happening, while, while, while Shin is doing her best magic circle impression, um, Ahsoka has a fight with Balin. <laughs> and they have some dialogue. Yeah. And uh, she, why don't you run us through this one? Okay, so if I'm remembering correctly, I didn't like take down the actual dialogue itself, but basically. Uh, he says, Anakin spoke very highly of you. And she's like, funny, he didn't mention you at all. Um, which already I'm kind of like, so she doesn't know who he is. Even though he seems to have had at least some kind of relationship with Anakin, question mark? Maybe? Either way, he, least, what yeah. I really want to focus on, what I want to fo- focus on, yeah, is like he says everyone in the Order knew of Anakin. Fewer lived to see what he became, implying that he knows about Vader somehow. How do I, you know? The this? thing about Balin is that I don't know what he knows and what he doesn't know, and how he knows the things he knows. Like it's all just like, yeah, I guess. Well, we yeah, kind of know nothing about, about him. That's kind of the thing, right? Well, this is the problem, right? Because like Ray Stevenson, yeah. bless him, and like again, rest in peace, Ray Stevenson. Um, he's showing his best with what with what is a very scant script and character. So he's walking around being impressive and wise and a bit like stoic and strange and mysterious. But like underneath, like the, the we kind of mentioned this earlier, this air of mystery has no substance to it. Underneath, like the kind of vague sense of mystery, there is no actual concrete mystery to unpack. There is just like the promise that there might be a mystery somewhere. And so we're dropping all these tidbits that in isolation sound spooky and cool. But you actually look at them and think about them for two seconds. And you're like, what the fuck? How do you know this? How can you like, not only mm. how can you know this, but the fact that you know this is kind of damaging. Like at this point... Are we, are we literally doing like again, like almost like robot chicken, where like everyone actually knew who Vader was and like pretended to be choked out by him and just wore a silly <laughs> mustache like same round? Like, was was Vader the only one who actually thought his, that his identity was a secret? Like everyone just seems to know now. I'm just imagining. Well, I'm just imagining like somehow, like so everyone in the Rebel base knows about Anakin and what he became, and like Luke keeps talking about how he, how he wants to really follow in his father's footsteps, and they're all just like looking really concerned. Like y- <laughs> you do. You know that deleted scene at A New Hope where like, that guy's like, oh, I, f- I flew with your dad back in the day. If you're like him, we'll be just fine. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's like, man. Well, it's one of those things yeah, where and like, I'm imagining actually... just nobody told him. He managed to go three years without knowing and then Vader like revealed it to him and he's like, no, I just found out a terrible truth, guys. And they're like, yeah. Like, we actually weren't <laughs> even sure what you knew and we were concerned about your like your your, your intentions here. It's that moment in Kung Fu Panda 2 where Poe's like, I've just found out that my dad isn't my dad. And Tigress is like, your dad the goose. <laughs> that must have been quite a shock. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just, it's, uh, it's, the other thing this reminds me of is like, you know how Ahsoka has already met Luke? We saw that on screen. Like them, They've known each other for at least a little while. Mm. She has that line where she's like, wow, you're so much like your father. And like with the context of episode five, Looking back, I'm like, wow, was she was just being really rude to Luke? <laughs> it's like, wow, you really remind me of, uh, yeah, of Vader, Luke. Yeah, because she's really, she apparently hasn't reconciled with like what Anakin is now in terms of what he used to be and, and all that. Like, she still sees him as kind of a monster. And like, yeah, that's a weird thing to say to Luke given that context. Yeah, but especially like with, in our head canon of everyone actually knowing except Luke. It's like everyone's dropping these like what he thinks like thinly veiled compliments. And they're actually like stealth insults. <laughs> it's like, he wow, like, you're really good with children, just like, like your dad. He was good with children machine. too. No, he, he like cut in line to the vending machine and one of the rebels was like, you're just like your father, you know that? And he's like, thank you. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, I don't know. This is like obviously jumping a completely different franchise, but uh, you guys, uh, do either of you guys, any of you guys watch Star Trek or know anything about Star Trek? Um, I don't. My family yeah, does. Not yeah. really. I know Shiny like, does, but that's about it, really. Very, I've seen bits and pieces there's here and there, but I really don't know anything about it. There's a, I've there's watched, a recur- love it, but I don't pay attention to it. There's a, I've there's watched, a recur- sorry, sorry, go ahead, Jolly. <clears throat> there's Let a recurring villain called. <laughs> there's a recurring villain called Khan. And like he turns up in one episode of the classic series, and like, <gasps> is, is, yeah, 
that guy. And like later on, he comes back for a movie where he's like the main villain. And in that movie, the first person he meets is Chekhov, who's like was previously an ensign on the Enterprise. The problem is that like Chekhov hadn't been introduced into the series at the time that the Khan episodes aired. He, he only came later, but Khan recognizes him as like, oh yes, you from the Enterprise. And so fans were like, wait, how, how do they know each other? And so there was like this weird head cannon developed where like Khan was waiting to use the toilet for ages and like Chekhov wouldn't get out. And so like when he finally got out and like <laughs> Khan was like, I will never forget your face, man who has held me up on the toilet. <laughs> just like they did, that's the same for Luke, right? Like he's like using the toilet in the rebel base and like, man, you're just like your dad. And he's like, oh, cool. Thanks, man. <laughs> he, Khan is the guy played by Benny Booble Kumba Wobble, right? Yeah, uh, Bambus, Bandersnatch Cucumber Wobble. Mm-hmm. Look at the thing I just sent, uh, the tweet by Blu-ray Angel. It's uh, oh, Ezra when Sabine tells him how, 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 how Ezra really? when Sabine tells him she betrayed Ahsoka and helped Thrawn get back. You what? It's that, it's that <laughs> Yo, oh. sorry, you, <laughs> you what? I, I'm still in utter disbelief that even happened. Like, it's insane. What a fucking embarrassment. Yeah. Holy we're shit. We're about to get there because we're about to get to Sabine's character break. Oh, oh, I have a lot um, to say about this. Yeah. Well. But we still have a little yeah. bit more to break down about this dialogue exchange between Balin and Ahsoka. So then she's basically like, so you realize you're going to start another war, right? And he's like, well, I'm not, but Thrawn will, um, which is necessary. And all so that. you're uh, starting like, a war, but you aren't. You're not directly like, doing what, it, but you're causing what do you want, you're creating a situation where it will start. <laughs> what are like, your what motives... Are- what are anyone's motives? Like even Thrawn when he turns up, like oh, Thrawn is the big bad guy. He wants to rebuild the empire. Why? Like seriously, what's his investment in that? Why I have would no he? Idea. Yeah. Uh, because he's evil. Considering I guess. his canonical motivations were to protect the Chiss ascendancy, the empire was always a means to an end to him. If they're not, right. if they don't have the resources to even keep hold of their own galaxy, why would he care about restoring them to their glory? He would just go back to the unknown regions. Pretty I mean, much, what? yeah. Why is he even working for them at all? If like, because I mean, the chess haven't been mentioned, and like, we're not we're not getting the Yuuzhan Vong or the Grisk. So, what's what? Why does he care about the Empire? I don't understand. Why does Morgan care? Why do the Night Sisters want Thrawn back? Why do they care about any of this? What the fuck is going on? How does Thrawn even fucking know the Night Sisters? <sighs> How is he? It would actually be an interesting subversion. Would actually be an interesting subversion, and I know they're not going to do this because this would actually take any level of nuance or character work. But like, if in the in the next set of episodes, like Thrawn is like, I actually didn't care about the Empire, and I never did. Um, this was all I I only said all this shit to you guys because I wanted to get back to my galaxy. I'm gonna go fuck back off to uh, my people now. You guys can deal with your shit. She, of course, so we know saying... that's not true. Thanks to Mando season three, but yeah. so so you're saying that Thrawn never really cared for the Empire, innocent or otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. You know what, it Jolly? So I suppose now. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I he just kind of forgot that is about in his fact motivations. what I'm saying. Oh, Ron kind of forgot Jesus. that he has an entire species that he cares about. Yeah. The um, just kind of forgot to give any yeah, of his motivations. The and then I think that's all that happens between, that's all that's said between Balin and, and Ahsoka. And then she turns on her lightsaber and he's just like, oh, how inevitable. And it's like, well, yeah, you just said that you're going to like cause a war to break out. Yeah, and then she they have a, they have a fight which is like remarkably even. But I guess you know maybe Balin is just that skilled. But then if that's the case, use your second lightsaber, you daft tit. Like I just, what are you doing, Ahsoka? You, you daft punk. Yeah, do, do, do not invoke the great name of daft punk in relation to something as terrible as Ahsoka. <laughs> We're up all night for good fun. Yeah. We're up all night yeah. to the sun. The Tron, the Tron Legacy soundtrack as well. They were great. So good, dude. Yes, yeah, fantastic. Man, hey, Michael Sheen's in that movie. Hey TK, can, but... T- hey, TK, can you stop yeah. like changing your fucking profile picture every five seconds? Yeah, I'm fine with this one. It's Rebels, so it's on topic. Bro, I'm going to be going to fucking consistent I'm totally going to go on the fucking Tron roller coaster they have. It's got the soundtrack from Legacy. It's so cool. That's great. It's really well. We got Tron Aries coming with Jared Leto. That'll be great. I had someone anyway. on my server telling me I should make a video on the the Tron movies and the show they apparently made that I've never heard of before. I this is this is one of my weird little claims of fame. I actually know the writer of the first movie. She's, oh, a, really? she's a vague she's a vague acquaintance of mine. Yeah, Bonnie McBird. Cool. She's really nice. nice. Um, she wrote cool. a Sherlock Holmes novel. Tell her I, I said hi. A, 
<laughs> I, I will. She wrote a Sherlock Holmes novel called Art and the Blood and another one called Unquiet Spirits. And I think a third one called The Devil's Due. But like when she wrote the first one, I was uh, an intern, a production intern at uh, the Agatha Christie, Festi ah, Agatha Christie Festival in Torquay. And she was debuting her book there. So we, we got to meet. That was nice. Anyway, cool. side notes. Neat. <laughs> Back to the episode. Um, yeah, so uh, then the fight breaks out. Um, let's see. What else do I have to say? I mean, you know, pretty... Pretty fucky di uh not dialogue, uh choreography, of course. Um, which is funny because this is like I remember in the behind the scenes stuff, this was the fight that they were showing footage of when Dave Filoni said, um, you know, we gotta make sure that the choreography is good because fans can tell the difference. Um, which is a clip that I'm absolutely gonna be using throughout my video. Um, yes, yes, Dave. We absolutely can tell the difference. Well done. Some weird stuff. We're like like again, Ahsoka's not using her a second lightsaber to full effect like at all um there's like a lot of there's a lot of kenobi style um fight like moments where like that like both have several opportunities at multiple points to you know cut or stab each other and they just don't uh they keep doing like um like you, you know that part in rise of skywalker where um ben like bends over with his lightsaber behind his back in anticipation for the night of ren to uh, strike at him, and his 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 block is a, his his lightsaber is able to block the blow. I, there's a lot of there's a couple of, like moments in this fight that are a little bit like that, where it feels like almost like this was a uh, a pre rehearsed dance that Balin and Ahsoka agreed to, not that they're actually trying to kill each other, or at the very least yeah, like stop lot, each other in some way. There's a lot of um, waiting around for, for you know first of all there's a lot of like, you know hitting their blades against the other blade and not aiming for the actual person. Um, there's also a lot of just like standing around waiting mm -hmm. for the other person to get into position, um, which makes the whole thing look really tedious and crap. There's also just like, yeah, the, the running thing we've already mentioned several times now, which is you have a Shoto blade, which would be really useful when, when you have like, you know, if one of your lightsabers is, a, is currently blocking his only one, you have a free hand to stab him. If only you had a second lightsaber. Mm -hmm. <sighs> uh, but then we there's a moment some... where their blades are locked and Ahsoka is backed into a corner and Balin says, your legacy, like your master's, is one of death and destruction, uh, which is just something that needs to be noted, jotted down. Uh, that's going to be relevant and more in the next episode, but it's worth having pointed out here. Yeah, I am fine. I am fine for Balin to think this. I am fine for Balin mm -hmm. to think Balin, this. Balin, since he apparently knows that Anakin is Vader, like... Uh, he may not know that, like that, he ended up becoming good again. But like, whatever, he apparently knows about Vader. So yeah, sure, he would think that. That's fine. And that's the thing. I, I I posted about that on Twitter, um, and I used that quote, and then I was like, so anyway, yeah. And then I was showing like what Anakin's legacy actually is, and people were talking about how like that's what Balin would think, or like that's what the galaxy at large would think. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You misunderstand. the The point I'm making is that's not what Ahsoka would believe. And we're going to get into or that. Yeah, or should believe. Um, should believe, yeah. But then, so that's what Balin says to her, and she takes it to heart. That's that's what's worth noting. Um, so then the fight goes on, and she, like, Ahsoka is backed toward the edge of a cliff. And then she sees that Shin is here. She's made it back to Stonehenge and realizes that that must mean... Oh, wait, no, sorry. Th this would be after she knocked the map off, right, and, like, burned her hand. Yeah. Yeah, so that happened. She pulled the map off and it burned her hand, uh, which doesn't seem to really be affecting her that much, but fine. Um, or I guess it was, right? Because now she's using one hand to hold her lightsaber instead of the two. Yeah, the implication is that like what this is actually doing is just making it hard for her to block uh, a sustained like drive down on her from, from you know, in, in a saber lock. I mean, saber locks are stupid anyway, but in... In the saber locks that we get, she can no longer sustain like the force needed to keep the blades level when he's bearing down on her, basically, because she can't use her her full strength. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but then she notices that Shin is back and 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 surmises that, that must mean that Sabine is in trouble or dead or something, which is like, yeah, so you probably shouldn't. <laughs> Whatever. Shouldn't All right. Her. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah, bitch. <laughs> um. <laughs> but then she like in it, like as a reaction to this like grabs Shin with the force and throws her against one of the stone like she Shin, Shin hits it head first and like gets knocked out like she hits I it I guess really she does hard. have the force then 
Um, what? No, I, said I guess she does have the force. Oh, okay. I thought I, was, no. I thought it said Sabine. I'm an idiot. Sorry. Oh no, no, you, no, that's okay. You, you fool! You, you, you fool! You've ruined the momentum of my argument. Anyway, ah, but like, it's my immediate thing was like, yeah, well, whenever whenever she does wake up, she should she better at least have a concussion. She doesn't, but like, yeah, that's yeah, she gets hit in the head pretty hard. Uh, so Shin's out of the fight. It's just her and Balin, and then Sabine shows up, picks up the map, and holds it at gunpoint. And just like stop, and you know, Ahsoka is obviously encouraging her to destroy it because that's what they talked about at the beginning of the episode. We're we're paying off that whole conversation and all the very not subtle foreshadowing for what's about to happen. Um, Sabine can't bring herself to shoot it, uh, and in this moment of distraction for Ahsoka, Balin's able to knock her off the cliff, and Ahsoka's gone. She's out of the fight, and it's now down to Balin and Sabine, and he manages to like sort of talk her down he's walking toward her he's like trying to appeal to her more selfish nature of like you know you love ezra he has a line that's weird where he says uh two two lines that are weird but one of them is um you know deep down in your heart that ezra is the only person you have left which is like okay i guess fuck Hera and and zeb and you know well well, jason basically a nephew to her she never really cared for them innocent or otherwise (laughs) I'm wondering why why she wouldn't just shoot it right there and then. That's what I'm kind of wondering. Is there like well, a reason for that? Well, that that's that's the thing. Which, is like the show is trying yeah. the show is trying to paint it as though she should and she could, but she won't. She can't bring herself to because she wants to find Ezra. Uh, now, the second thing that Balin says that's really weird is um, fuck. I think I have the exact quote. Hang on, I want to make sure I get this right. Um. No, I don't have the exact quote, but basically she says he says that Sabine's family died because her master didn't trust her. Something that Ahsoka did or didn't do based on her opinion of Sabine, whatever the case, Ahsoka is somehow responsible for the death of Sabine's biological family on Mandalore. Or at the very um, least, the where Sa- that's Sabine what thinks Sabine that's. believes. Yeah. What so it? she was um, around during the OT then. <laughs> doing yeah, something. So it's just... just... And not helping There's a lot with the to main unpack conflict here, at right? hand. It's, it's like, whatever happened, we still don't know. And I don't think we're ever going to find out. That could have been a great thing to actually flash back to in episode five. If we're talking about, like, Ahsoka's self-doubt and what she believes her legacy is. Like, you know, you could have told us what happened there. Um, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll get to all that. But yeah, whatever the case, Sabine is of the belief that Ahsoka is responsible for the death of her family. Now, does anyone here think that it would be within character for Sabine to just shrug that off? To in any way no. be like buddy buddy with no. Ahsoka in these episodes at all? <laughs> no, of no. course not. She would resent her. She would probably try to kill her. Well, this is the thing, right? Like at at the very least, um, she would you know, if if Sabine holds Ahsoka responsible for the death of her family, even like only partially, she would just fucking refuse to talk to her, work with her, do anything with her at all. It would just be, it would just be a no go. And mm-hmm. yeah, as you said, potentially it might even be a, I'll, I'll, if you ever come across me, if we ever cross paths again, I'll fucking shoot you. Um, mm-hmm. Like Sabine's a part of a warrior <laughs> culture after all that has a real blood feud like vibe to it. You know, she would hate Ahsoka. The tension that they're trying to build, like they, they they they've been building between these two characters in the first three episodes, is like. Uh, I was your student, but you clearly like didn't believe in me. Then you abandoned me. I'm still not really cool with that. But like, you know, we're not on terrible terms or anything. Like, it's it's more awkward and and, and if any, than anything else. But like, no, it would be fuck you. I hate you. And I and like even if even if somehow they end up working together because like you know th- this could involve getting Ezra back. It would be very much like you know she'd be like talking shit to her constantly, constantly putting her down. Like making snide jabs at her, uh, ignoring her whenever uh, Ahsoka tries to make any kind of conversation, you know, stuff like that. It, it wouldn't just yeah. be, oh yeah, you never made things easy on me, master. Like shut up, shut the yeah, fuck up. It's 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 really again. This is the kind of thing like characters don't have depth, they don't have motivations, they don't have consistency like this. The, the, what we have been shown is completely at odds with what we are now being told um like to a startling and, and kind of hilarious degree um it, it it reeks of someone who doesn't understand how people work which is kind of funny mm-hmm. and very and i guess very in character for dave filoni 
but yeah, the the other part of this is just like the 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 absolute assassination, which is Sabine gives into this temptation. Apparently, she does value Ezra over everything else because she she agrees to hand the map over to to Balin on 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 the, on, you know, on the mm-hmm. promise of the strength of his word that he'll take her to Ezra. Which <laughs> that'll be a funny one. That doesn't pay off. Um, <laughs> but but long before we get to that, I just like to I just like to lay this all out. Right, so <clears throat> Sabine Wren. Mm-hmm. Sabine Wren is a character from Mandalore who we have spent entire season-long you know, television arcs uh, developing. Uh, specifically, her backstory is she's part of a proud family and a proud warrior culture. She is very invested in her culture. She loves Mandalore. She loves her family. She loves their traditions. Um, she is very, very on board with all this. Now, y- utilizing her artistic nature as a design challenge, she creates a weapon that turns the very cultural like heart of Mandalorians against them as a, as a weapon and leads to their subjugation and enslavement by the Empire. And when she stands up to, to try and account for that fact, she's already caused so much damage that her family disown her and she has to go on the run. And multiple arcs of television on, on Rebels is then spent on this relationship, how much she loves her family, how much guilt she feels at handing over a weapon to the empire that was used to punish and hurt the people she loves, what that actually means to mm-hmm. collaborate with the empire, even by accident. She she wrestles with the legacy of ruling Mandalore and potentially having to lead people with the dark saber and giving that up to a real ruler. She understands, therefore, what these 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 weapons, these signifiers mean and can mean in terms of their consequences, and she is deeply invested in Mandalore. She is. She fully understands. And then again, okay, and then on the other side of that, if she gives this thing up, she's going to be bringing back Thrawn, who will reignite a whole war, a war that has already, you know, from a faction that has already claimed the lives of her entire family, culture, and planet, and and Kanan, and potentially, as far as she knows, Ezra as well, and countless innocents on Lothal that she watched being blown to smithereens, and she willingly mm-hmm. hands over the means to bring all of this horror back, all the people like she, to bring back and reunify the people who fucking took everything from her, just so that she can maybe see Ezra again, maybe. Also, completely undoing his sacrifice, yeah, no. which she knows about. Like, yeah, no, not no, not not my Sabine. Fuck this, Skinwalker Sabine. Yeah, total it's, assassination. It's... Even worse than what Scott. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Wait, Balin. why exactly would why would Sabine trust what's his name though, Balon? Why would well, she? Well, good, good question. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, um, just shoot it. I get like, like <laughs> even if if we're just assuming that this is something that she would do, which no, I guess she believes she doesn't have a choice because like it's either I give the map to him or I destroy it and he kills me and then I never see Ezra again. Um, wow. Be a, well, first of all, she should be willing to die for that cause. She should be absolutely okay to die for that. But secondly, she should be. Yeah. Wow, be really useful if you had a jetpack, eh? <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, what the fuck? Is the fuck well, I guess he could. I guess he could just catch her with the force, like 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 force users can do with ships now. No, because he can shoot. At, remember, she can shoot at him as she's flying away, so he'd have to spend time deflecting it. Wouldn't be able to use the force. And she also would know this true. because she's trained with Jedi, and her, she's from a culture that fought Jedi, so she knows this. Mm-hmm. Do you guys want me to add insult to injury with this whole situation of character assassination for the Rebels characters? Yeah, yes. Uh, so it. Rebels was not created by Dave Filoni, as a lot of people think. He was the executive producer, uh, and he did not write much of the first half of the series. He started writing a lot more in season three and four, um, oh, and especially sense. the Ahsoka episodes in uh, season two. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, is uh, it was Simon Kinberg. He was the creator of this show. Um, as in he was the creator of these characters as well. They're not Filoni's characters. Filoni did not come up with these characters. He's not writing his own characters. He's taking somebody else's work, completely changing them, fucking them up, removing them from the context in which they work, and now they're just a husk of who they used to be. That's that makes a lot of sense, considering he doesn't seem to understand them. Right. Take somebody else's work and then fuck it up. I mean, that's that's the thing with with Sabine and uh, Ezra. They're not they're not supposed to be siblings. They're supposed to be in love with each other. That's the whole point in Rebels. That's those two well, characters love each other. Well, mostly I mean, Ezra I, loving Sabine. But I, I'm thing is, I'm happy this because like, I'm not wedded to this either way. I'm happy for it to be platonic. I'm happy for it to be romantic. I, I, I or even unrequited in one direction. I don't really care. The point is, however it's framed, these are two characters who really care about each other. And in Sabine's case. 
knows exactly what the cost to the people she loves will be if she brings back this faction, has already suffered grotesquely at their hands, like more than, you know, other than maybe people who survive who are off the world on Alderaan. No one in this galaxy has had as much taken mm-hmm. away from them as like Sabine has. Um, the idea that she's going to make render Ezra's entire sacrifice, Kanan's entire sacrifice, the lives of all the Mandalorians who've died absolutely meaningless by bringing back the Empire, just so she can maybe see a guy including she her own family. Again. Yeah, including her mother, own father, and brother. I, I just, I just, I just, I, no, I, yeah, no, fuck that. Assa- assassination, assassination doesn't really quite do this justice. This is the most thorough assassination of a character in a single moment I have seen since I never really cared for them, innocent or otherwise. Mm-hmm. What do we? I fuck it. Worse than Luke and TLJ, I think. It's uh, it's it's at it's at least as bad. I would say possibly worse. Is it as yeah. bad as um, Kenobi and Kenobi, though? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah it's no, worse it than that, yeah. That's worse than that. Is it? It's much worse. Really? Yeah. Kenobi, it's much, much Kenobi's worse. assassinated, but he's not turned into a fucking villain. Well, not... Yeah, I mean, not, I don't know. Kind of, I'd, 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 say, I'd say he's a villain. <laughs> well, no, he's just turned into an incompetent <laughs> tool, whereas, like, Sabine is now actively making yeah. villainous decisions, and this carries on into later episodes. Like, when we get to six, episode six, we can talk about this even more. She is making a- actively making incredibly villainous and selfish decisions now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I can't wait for Ezra to find out everything that she's done and like be upset with her about it. Surely he will be upset with her about the things that she's done, right? He's not just gonna oh, immediately yeah. forgive her, right? Well, you know, he kind of he kind of forgot about Sabine's right, Dave. Because Ezra wouldn't would be so fucking pissed if he found out what Sabine has done. <laughs> wow. It's it's horrendous. Well, we haven't gotten there yet, so we don't know. For all we know, they will actually treat Ezra like Ezra would would act. But well, we I don't. Mean, why the fuck know. would we assume? Well, we can make a really, really educated guess just given exactly. how boring yeah. like the stories. Yeah. The thing again, before we just proceed, right? Because I, I I feel like there's going to be at least one person listening or, or who will listen in the future who's going to like invade the comment section with really annoying comments. Um, who's going to say something along the lines of, "Oh, you're just bitter. You never gave the show a chance. You're just being really bad faith." And I would invite you to go back and watch the first <laughs> stream we did. We bent over backwards to give this show such, especially you know, considering we came off the back of Mando season three, such incredible good faith. Like, yeah, we I'd were, say too much. To be we honest, were, we were worried about the direction Maybe it could too go. Much. Yeah, well, like, no, I, I would. I'll stand by my 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 assessment of the first two episodes in isolation. But the thing we said at the time, both me and Sheev was, uh, or Sheev and I, I should say, to be grammatically correct, was that this is going to be contingent a lot on like what they do going forward. And like to say that they have like sunk below the bar of my expectations. I mean, the bar was already in hell. And yet, here they are. These chuckle fucks brought shovels, and here they are in hell, limbo dancing with the devil. It's just, I can't, I can't express the level of my distaste and disappointment at the fucking unbelievable nuclear chemical clusterfuck that is this abysmal ode to terrible writing. What the fuck are you playing at? Insulting. It's a complete a waste of all of our times. Ingredients. Ah, oh, fuck. What's that quote? It took the combined ingredients of stupidity, ineptitude, and total disengagement for this farce to reach the apex of its, uh, fuck. You, you guys know what to I'm talking the about. Apex, the to reach the line. apex of its it's fuck. Mean. Yeah, yeah, the apex of its fuck. <laughs> An incredulous fuck. disaster, that's what it was. Oh, and that yeah. quote's going to get some mileage in my video, let me tell you. I mm. think that quote's going to get a lot of mileage from a lot of us. <laughs> I'm going to use it too. <laughs> Not in regards to this show. I'm never covering the show on my YouTube channel. I never want to talk about Star Wars uh, again. Chief, I'll, t- I'll tell you what. Can you imagine, just to, add, like, to, to profoundly add insult to injury, can you imagine if in like episode seven or eight, we get a uh, Amando season three moment where Filoni's like, huh, politics. Ooh. <laughs> like, can, can you, can you, we got close. If, we got really if, close with the Hera scene where she's meeting with uh, Zion. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, we did get yeah, very close that there. One. Like, <sighs> If we have an Ahsoka moment, which is a full blown like, oh, politics boring, as you know, and or bad, I'm just gonna lose my shit. I'm just like this fucking vaudevillian yeah, check, clown uh, car. Check the Ahsoka chat. I want to make sure everyone gets like consents to this before I do it. Yeah, sure, have men. Oh yeah, absolutely, that's fine. Thumbs up. I'm cool. He's with that. cool. I like shiny a lot. Get and here it cool. is. 
Here it is. It took the combined ingredients of idiocy, ineptitude, and total disengagement for this farce to have reached the full apex of incredulous disaster. So I was close. I was <laughs> right. That's great. Yeah, shoot, you're, you're almost you're apex. almost a real you're almost a free, a real Andar fan. Andar, fuck Andar. You. I can't pronounce it properly. I'm, I'm catching Andar, Chandrila. <laughs> I just, again, uh, obviously people are going to be like, oh, you're just comparing Andor and you can't, comp I, I really love that you can't compare these two things. Yes, I fucking can. Shut the fuck up. But like, we have Andor. I, I hate to break this to people. We have Andor and we can compare these two shows and just like, it's night and day in hey, terms shiny. of quality. Like, it's a hey, oh. Greetings, Hello, Clone shiny. Trooper. <clears throat> I think that is the, the funniest thing ever. This is the best show in Star Wars ever. But don't compare it to Andor, guys. You can't do that. Can't well, do that. I always love it's not fair to compare it to Andor. They're they're accomplishing different things. I I one one is accomplishing being a story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I, I one's accomplishing. I can't compare them. Like saying like, oh yeah, one's one's trying to be a fantasy. One's trying to be gritty and realistic. I'm like, I'm not comparing that. I'm comparing how one actually has characters in a world who do things that make sense. One is Ahsoka. Yeah, I just the thing is this argument's really silly, right? Because that's a bit like saying, "Oh, you know, Haunting of Bly Manor is a horror series, um, therefore you can't compare it to I don't know, Hunt for Red October." And I'm like, "You can though. Like, you can't compare them directly in terms of genre, but you can compare them just in terms of like how successfully did these stories pay off the themes they were setting up. Like, you can just look at them as like a mechanical comparison in the same way that like I could be like, is it you know, I could compare a tractor to a to a Lamborghini and be like, well, obviously I'm not comparing their top speeds, but I am comparing how well they function as machines to do the job they're doing." One of the statements right. worse than that, because by saying that this is the best Star Wars show, you are making a statement that compares this to everything else that has came before yeah, it. Absolutely. And then to say, no, you can't compare it. It's like, no, but you're already comparing this, so make this statement. Like, what else are you trying to compare it to in Star Wars That by saying that it's the best? Like, you, you're know. limiting it to only, like mando and obi-wan like then at that point why are you excluding mando from this absolute statement you're, you're saying this like the people who make these claims have any kind of internally consistent thought process and like that's that's very nice of you but it is i'm afraid misplaced um i've been oh, like my patience has run out my, my well of goodness has and and uh, kindness and compassion and consideration towards these kind of people has run dry like like whatever you want I'm not taking that away from you, nor what I seek to, but I am so tired of the level of vitriolic, narcissistic, self-obsessed, pandering, whining, two-faced bullshit I have to wade through on Twitter every time when these shows come out. Grow That's up. Twitter, though. Maybe. Well, I'll always say this to people is like, I platform. never give a shit what you enjoy or what you don't enjoy. And that's something people just don't understand when they're in conversation with me with this stuff. I like garbage. I'll openly admit I like garbage. I like Rogue One. I like Bayformers. I like most of the MCU. I like a lot of garbage. And that's perfectly fine. As long as I acknowledge that it is garbage, I'm able to accept, yeah, there are flaws. What I like isn't this, you know, shining paragon of quality, which is an issue for these people. Because then they'll see me criticizing something. And I've had people straight up just reply to me just with that meme of quit having fun. I'm not telling people they can't have fun. Like, ever. I don't care if you have fun or not. That's not my place. If you had fun, sure, cool. I, I don't care. Yeah, we're not Mahler. <laughs> well, right. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the thing, right? Because there's, there's I a actually kind of level defended of, people from Mahler the other day. There's a kind of level of irony. Because I, I, I completely agree with you, Steve. But there is a kind of level of irony here from the, don't have, the, the people who post that meme, right? Of like, oh, you're just saying stop having fun. No, we're not. But when you post that tweet, what you're really saying is, I get to decide what is and isn't fun. So if you tell me it's not fun, you're wrong. It's like, um, no, actually. Right. I'm, I'm telling allowed you to not find it fun. Not, yeah, I'm telling you to it's, shut up and you're yeah, not allowed to have fun. Or not allowed to not have fun. It, it's, it's kind of just like the same thing in reverse, which is like, what if I'm having fun criticizing it because it's bad? What now? Yeah. yeah. Much, it's yeah. the boring. Um, it's the boring thing all over again. When people go, I don't like it because it's boring. I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. Shut up. I'm sorry. Like outside of your circle <laughs> of friends, where you're just expressing an opinion, it's it's that's like to them that's fine. But when you're trying to venture some kind of mechanical analysis of a piece of work or an artistic and uh, analysis of something, it's fucking meaningless. It doesn't. Oh, it doesn't tell me. I anything. had a great debate with some fucking moron on Twitter the other day with that. That was so funny. I was trying to explain why if you're going to talk about the quality of Attack of the Clones. Don't bring up why it's boring. I'm not speaking for or against Attack of the Clones. I didn't even bring up my own stance on Attack of the Clones at all. But 
you had people who were fucking jumping down my throat saying, oh, you're trying to defend Attack of the Clones. It's just a boring film. It didn't connect with audiences. I'm like, I don't care if it didn't connect with audiences. That does not make it a bad oh, film. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Attack of the Clones is a masterpiece. We need a CW live action show of <laughs> Attack of the Clones. Attack of the I Clones is a more consistent Attack of the plot. For being the origin of the two worms. <laughs> oh, yeah, true. Sure. Hang on a sec. There's something I want to know. Um, Jala, you mentioned something before about the Andor and Ahsoka comparison, right? How one's trying to be fantasy and the other's um, trying to be more gritty and realistic. Why can't fantasy be gritty and realistic to, well, that's to my, whoever that's my, said that? That's my point, right? Because the, the, the comparison I use is like Bly Manor and like The Hunt for Red October. But if someone was to be like, oh, you know, I said like one's a horror and one's like a thriller or right, whatever. But if someone came to me and was like, oh, no, Bly Manor is just a straight up horror. I'm like, well, it is a horror, but it's also a romance. It's also a drama. It's also like mm -hmm. very good show. Very good shows very rarely are just one genre. They tend to be like predominantly one thing, but they're not solely one thing. Like, you know, Arcane is a fantasy. It's not just a fantasy. Um, to call it just a fantasy would be an extremely original Star Wars is a, is sci-fi, but it's also fantasy. It's also a space opera. Like these things fall into multiple categories because they're complex and detailed and rich. Um, life is very <laughs> rarely black and white, and I'm tired of people making these reductive statements, these absolutist claims of just Sam Montgomery. Bollocks. Thanks for the super chat. Yes, exactly. I also like Freddy versus Jason. I it's it's such a funny movie. It's terrible. It's it's kind of like Halloween Six in a way. Like I, both versions, but specifically the director's cut. I love Halloween Six. I have such a fun time watching Halloween Six every year. Um, I still need to um, we yeah. still need to watch like Alien Resurrection, Chief. Like I need to take you through the bad Alien movies because oh. they're funny. <laughs> I got yeah, we do got to go through because we because so the thing is that I'd only ever seen the first one, and then Jolly was like, "Well, you got to see Aliens. It's actually good." And so I, I, we watched it, and it was great. And of course, um, you know, it was something I'd been missing out all these years. But now we get to watch Alien 3. Jolly, you get to watch that with me. <laughs> yeah. I, so the funny thing was, I was trying to avoid spoiling it for Sheev, because I was like, you know, because we ended Aliens, and he was like, man, I really like Newt, and I really like Hicks. I really can't wait to see more of them. And I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> so I was, trying not, I was trying not to say anything. Um, but I had, I had intimated earlier that like, Alien 3 is not a good movie at all. It's basically so just Terminator <laughs> 3 and what it does. It just makes the second film fucking irrelevant. Yeah, and so she was like, oh, I'll look up the plot synopsis. And like, obviously, the first line of the synopsis is like, having, you know, having crash landed and having Hicks and, and Newt dead. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, okay, fuck this movie. I'm already out. Like, fuck this. It's all right. I already don't consider it canon. I haven't even seen it. Oh, There's actually I, a, a comic book uh, line that comes after Aliens that's actually does way more with the story of Ripley and even Newt, where I would recommend way more than Aliens 3. Is that the one? Do you remember Aliens Colonial Marines? That, that, that peak of gaming where, the, <laughs> where they're like, oh, Hicks didn't actually die. The guy in the tube is somebody else and Hicks actually got out. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> 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 oh, it's And Hicks falls back onto like LV-426. It's, it's so fucked. The Aliens universe, after Aliens, has been so barking fucking mad. I mean, that being said, I love a I love AVP because AVP is just one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> but like, I, I will uphold forever that Alien: Isolation is one of the the best yeah, horror games great. in existence. Like, just the atmosphere is dripping so much in that game. I love it. It's it's phenomenal. I will say, like, it has too many endings. It does it does tend to have like fifteen endings, yeah. but. I, it's the only thing outside the original two movies that I consider to be canon to that universe. Mm. Um, it's basically Alien 1.5, and it's brilliant. It's really good. Anyway, we should probably finish off Ahsoka, because we finished the Balin fight in Ahsoka and, and Sabine's monumental betrayal. Finish off Ahsoka? Ew. I mean, Balin's already got Sorry, there ahead of me, so... <laughs> oh, yeah, oh Sheev, yeah. I want to fin finish off Shin. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. Right, <bro. clears throat> um, sh sh yeah, Shin wakes back... <laughs> Shin wakes back up and uh, is very angry and force chokes um, Sabine and Balan's like, no, no, let her go. I made her a promise and unlike her former master, I'm going to keep my word. They put her in chains, they take the map. <laughs> oh, no. Balan, yeah, Balan destroys the map and they go up to the big hyperspace ring where they are, the, you know, which they finally been getting beamed the last of the co hyperspace coordinates for, so they can make their trip. And who should turn up, Sheev? Mm -hmm. But... Uh, no, I forgot. She... Oh yeah, Hera. <laughs> yeah. Wait, sorry. Wait. 
yeah, so Hera and the and the gang get there, uh, including Jason. He's there too, which is fun. Um, and uh, yeah, they're like, oh fuck, that's a hyperspace ring, uh, and it's about to take off. Let's let's fly toward it. Um, and then they do, and then um, it jumps into hyperspace, and uh, huh, it yeah. It just so, uh, it powers I, I straight really through know. them. I, I don't know how to, how, yeah, how to like describe what happened. Like, it just jump, it like brute forces its way past them and disorients their ships and causes them to fry basically for a second. Many of the rebels die. Somehow Teva and Hera and Jason don't. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, shouldn't it's, all of them it, be dead though? Like... Now? It's a little disjointed yeah. because from the the way it's like, it's like they have two different perspectives of how their own <clears> world <throat> rules work. Because Hera gives the order to block their path with the assumption that if they get in the way, they can't. They seemingly can't go to hyperspace, or at least safely. And so we, we have to uh, assume that from her perspective, that's the way it works. But otherwise, she's just an idiot. And when they get in the way. There's obviously a completely different way this whole universe works, where she's just able to hyper the, the ring, the hyperspace ring, just go straight past them, almost like brunt forcing it. So well, is yeah. Hera but, just I mean, that's an what idiot? We're gonna... Because like, why did she just assume that sitting in the way would stop the hyperspace jump? So, <laughs> oh, I've done so much work um, on this. Now, so we. <laughs> It's time to break this down, but before you do, I got one more super chat to read out from Sam Montgomery. I made a made of, I made a mate of men watch. Oh, I made a mate of mine watch AVP one and two today. LOL. Oh, I hope you enjoyed. You made a watch or she you made a watch AVP two. What are you a sadist? Like, <laughs> goddamn, you owe that man an apology or that girl an apology or whoever it was. Yeah. You owe them an apology and possibly a drink. Like, goddamn. Why would you do that? You owe that Koopa Troopa that's running around with Ezra an apology. I'm just I'm just in <laughs> head canoning that Sam Montgomery's friend is one of those Koopa Troopa people. Yeah, and then in episode seven, <laughs> we're gonna get Kirby. We'll be introduced into the Star Wars universe <clears throat> as well. <laughs> so anyway, hyperspace travel. Fuck my life. So <laughs> so I went down, I went down a rabbit <laughs> hole with this. So Basically, I because I, I, I'm doing a whole video on this, and I, like I said before, I'm not going to break the whole video's work down here because we'd be here for a while. But I will just say that the way hyperspace works is that uh, when you are traveling within it, you, there is no physical object in, in hyperspace for you to hit. But what, what there is is the force of gravity from things in regular space it reaches across into hyperspace. And if you go too close to those gravity wells, and if they're too strong, you can be pulled back out into real space, at which point you will be pulled into the center of whatever the hell was causing that gravity well, which is normally like a planet or a large ship or a, or a star or whatever. And that will kill you because, you know, ramming things at light speed is pretty bad for your health um, mm -hmm. and the health of everything nearby. Traveling through hyperspace ain't like dust and crops, boy. You don't make yeah. precise calculations. You could hit a star or a supernova and that would end your trip real quick, wouldn't it? Anyway, so I delivered I deli I was... that exactly like Harrison Ford. I have very much. I have. I have Riz. No, yeah, you, you could be. You could be his twin. Um, <laughs> Harrison Ford. Uh, you said that exactly like all of his lines in Dial of Destiny. Um, That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck so that movie. I did. I did the calculations of like how fast is regular hyperspace travel relative to real space, right? And through a bunch of convoluted means, I, I, I too complicated the answer now. Basically. We have a kind of window here of what's possible, which is that either um, thing like I, I use the Millennium Falcon as the reference. The Millennium Falcon either travels through uh, hyperspace, you know, regular relative to regular space at one thousand eight hundred and fifty-two light years per hour, or you know, as, as a bottom for the slowest it could be going to a highest speed of sixteen thousand six hundred and sixty-seven light years per hour. Um, now. <laughs> We also get told by Han that the, the Falcon travels at 0.5 above light speed, which I'm just going to say is 1.5 times the speed of light, because I don't know what else the fuck that could possibly mean, absent any other context. And for those who don't know, that mm. is roughly a billion miles per hour, which means, depending on how long he spent in hyperspace in A New Hope, which I, I estimated is somewhere between like 3 and 27 hours, 
hyperspace, you know, the the hyperspace equivalent of fifty thousand light years, the distance between Tatooine Tat and Alderaan, is either three billion miles or twenty seven billion miles, which is a gigantic shortening of real space, like to a, an insane mm. degree. Anyway, the the upshot of all this was that I was interested, like, why normal ships can't just travel to other galaxies using regular hyperspace. Um, and so I did the, the calculations for how long it would take a regular Millennium Falcon to go between different galaxies. And again, depending on the galaxy's sort of distance from like as close as it could conceivably be to like about as far away as galaxies typically are from each other in the same cluster and using the two different speeds mm. as, a, as like potential bars, the Millennium Falcon could travel to another galaxy in anywhere between six days and 150 days-ish. All of which are very survivable distances that you could just survive by having enough food. And we know you can survive, you saw enough fuel to make those journeys because both Rebels and Solo confirm that ships can carry that kind of fuel um, to allow them to travel for like years, basically. Um, yeah. So, whatever is stopping regular ships from leaving the galaxy and going to a different galaxy has to be some kind of physical barrier, some kind of like gravity anomaly or space well or something. Otherwise, there is no reason why intergalactic travel wouldn't be a really common occurrence that everyone could just fucking do. Um, the best, the best guess I have for that is like some kind of like very thick dark matter halo around both of these galaxies, such that like if you try to hyperspace through it, the gravity would pull you back out, and you'd essentially be stuck in like a hyperspace glue trap, hundreds of thousands of light years from everything else, which means you'd be long dead by the time you got you tried to get back to anywhere else. Now, mm -hmm. this is all important because in order to get over that kind of barrier you would have to be going many, many hundreds of times faster for past light speed than the Falcon goes. And this is apparently what this hyperspace ring does. It allows you to travel at many, many hundreds of times the speed of light whilst in hyperspace, um, thereby cutting the distance, A, but also B, uh, allowing you to basically brute force your way past these gravity wells, because obviously the faster you're going, the harder, you know, the more gravity will be needed to pull you out. Um, but there's a side effect of all this, which is if that is what it's doing, and the ending of the show, sorry, the ending of that episode where he, she brute forces, they brute force their way past the, 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 the X-Wings does canonically prove that this is what they're doing. If that's what they're doing, and given that the engines were made on Corellia, that means the Empire had the capacity to brute force hyperspace lanes wherever they wanted in the galaxy, however they wanted, whilst going hundreds of times the speed of light, which essentially means that the Empire had the capacity technologically to teleport anything they wanted anywhere they wanted in the galaxy. And for some fucking reason, they didn't take advantage of that fact. Like, they mm -hmm. could have popped up the Death Star behind Yavin 4 in a split millisecond and blown it to fucking smithereens. They could have just jumped their fleets wherever they wanted in, like, essentially teleportation time. To say that this breaks hyperspace is such an understatement. Like, hyperspace, at least in the OT, <laughs> fucked. Just absolutely fucked. Um, I, oh, God, it's all so broken. Uh, well, and so yeah. the thing is, um, like, I, I'm, try I'm still trying to figure out how the Purgle are supposed to factor into this, because oh, it's not like yeah, they the can go ludicrous speed. Like No, the, they can. Uh, the no, they can. Hyperspace it's it's they? been confirmed. That oh, that's yeah, right. We confirmed. see them doing that in the, in the sixth episode. Okay. What? It's not even that. It's that Thrawn says that his his uh, in episode six, he's like, oh, the preparations to leave Peridia is going to take three days. Now, assuming Ahsoka is going to reach him before he leaves, that means the Purgle will have to make that intergalactic trip in three days or less. So they are going ludicrous well, yeah. speeds. We, but we also see them doing that in the uh, opening of the episode. Like we see them in hyperspace and there's like yeah. all those different colors around them, which implies that they're going faster than normal hyperspace or whatever. Yeah, the ludicrous yeah, speed. Yeah, so the purgle, I guess, can go ludicrous speed. Um, all right then. Yeah, those purgle, those purgle are broken. I, the thing is, the idea that these things are natural existing creatures, like natural existing creatures that have evolved the capacity to go to like intergalactically fast um, hyperspace, have anti gravity so they can fly in atmosphere unaided, and also apparently inertial dampeners in their mouths so that ships inside their throat don't just get zoomed out the back like a fucking bullet when they try and take off. Um, mm -hmm. Also, these things have these things the power actually. and potential to ram a star destroyer, and have the armor which can resist being hit with enough firepower that can glass a city. Well, I'm, I'm willing to forgive them the armor because I can imagine why, if you're a spacefaring creature, you would need very thick skin. Like that's, I'm sort of okay with that. Like that at least is something so I can as conceive of being naturally be very evolved. good at that. Then, sorry. So as what heels versus babyface. 
because he doesn't have a thick skin. Never mind. It was oh, yeah. in my head. Oh, <laughs> no, he was worries. making a joke. I was just confused. Wow. wow. Um, hey, Sheev. Uh, I, I sent something in the uh, yeah. Ahsoka group chat real quick. Something Joe said. You might want to take a look at that. Uh, okay. Um, sorry, what is this? Um, they're responding to a what tweet is, of yours. What, no, I know, but what is what does Joe mean? I, I like I genuinely don't know what they mean by that. Um, oh, oh hey. Oh wait, hang on. I think oh I, I sent it I sent it wrong, hang on. It was that was before her they made the typo. So they say, wait, does does he th- he think Balin was someone whose word is meant to be taken? He's the villain, the one who's wrong. Uh I already addressed that I, in this very stream. Yeah. That's oh, not I what I, I meant that. by that I'm tweet down. at all. Just well, being, basically, just being a villain doesn't make you wrong. It doesn't also doesn't mean you don't believe what you're saying. Well, basically, no. Like the idea is, well, that's what Balin would believe, and like, yeah, fine. It's not what Ahsoka would believe, and that's what I'm actually addressing with that tweet. Come on, Joe. Well, I, I think it's, I think Joe's I, like, saying I'm like, oh, Balin, lying mean. to her. Yeah. The problem like, is why? that Ahsoka believes it. Well, no, but it's, it's just like yeah, why when, would he lie? Joe's like, that's... Yeah, because Joe's like, oh, you know, it's, it's, that's not actually the case. He's lying to her. I was like, no, he's not. At least not from his perspective. Like, why the fuck would he? Just because just because you're a bad person doesn't mean that everything that comes out of your mouth is a lie. A lot of very terrible people tell half-truths or believe what they're saying. Or they just it's tell the full like, truth because it would benefit them in some way. Or because they yeah, have no reason like, to do otherwise. It's almost like fanatics exist and people can tell the truth for bad reasons. Like, it's, uh, I don't know, fuck it. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this conversation. Let's move on. <laughs> well i mean like yeah like if i'm evil right and i and like i lie to get my way or whatever um that doesn't mean i'm just gonna do it like whenever the fuck i want like i'm still just gonna tell the truth unless i unless i have to lie to get my way right because like trying to keep track of lies can be very tricky right you, you don't want to have to do that if you can help it is this referring to the uh, the line where he says where it's like your your lineage is death yeah yeah, your legacy, villains like can your never say something truthful. Very true, introverted robot. So villains can what? never say anything truthful. The, the thing is, though, and like Joe, I'm not trying to be mean like to you, but like I think that you've, I think that you've, uh, like, just completely misunderstood the point of my my tweet, and also made a point that I'm sorry, I really hate to make this comparison, is one that Dark Thor literally made in response to my Kenobi video. So, um, yeah. Uh, so again, to, with the, just, show, uh, just, the sorry, hang on, sorry, sorry, trying to just because I just wanted to rather than leave it hanging. I, I, I just want to parrot the same thing as like Sheev there. Like this is not me ragging on Joe. Joe is a really nice kid. Like it's it's just more. I'm I'm just disappointed and sad about what Disney is doing to people like Joe, people who want to approach media in good faith and are being like gaslit and taken advantage of by this fucking corporation that has no interest in telling a story. Um, anyway, sorry. Go on, Shiny. So the, the the show treats it like what he's saying is actually like true or at least ahsoka for some reason perceives it as being true otherwise what's the point of the the next episode where she goes through those trippy visions <laughs> a, a exactly question yeah for a different writer but also before we move on there is another super chat from sam that i kind of just let float by because jolly was in the middle of his big breakdown um but yeah he he uh, my mate is used to the abuse i made him watch jaws for Okay, Sam. Someone needs to I mean this from the bottom of my heart. You're a sociopath. Sam's trying to get <laughs> you to watch that poor all guy the Jaws go. movies. He's a fucking dick. S- Sam, Sam, you need to be. <laughs> you're a fucking sociopath. <laughs> I'm not fucking watching Jaws four. Actually, I probably will at some point. Sam, I'm gonna. If, if if you keep on treating your friend like this, I'm gonna call protective services. I'm gonna call like you know. I'm gonna have him removed from your custody <laughs> because he needs to be saved. <laughs> this is An too far. Relationship. <laughs> yeah, this is madness. You've gone too far. He also wants to force me to watch Pirates, uh, Pirates <sighs> Five. So, uh, oh god, oh yeah, he's god, a monster, actual oh, monster, Sam. Wow, actual sadism. Anyway, where are oh. we in the episode? Uh, well, I think oh, we, yeah, did, we just I think we're basically the whole in the hyperspace thing. Uh, yeah, we just finished hyperspace. Yeah. I think we're on the world between worlds now, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah. So basically, <laughs> oh, no. um, we're treated uh. to a nice shot of like the of the the cliffside that Ahsoka fell off of, and like the rocks just below, like where she definitely would have landed, <laughs> like given the angle and her trajectory. But whatever, she she might have missed the rocks. Fuck it. 
she only landed in the water from a very high height, which would still be very impactful. Um, and she's woken up in the world between worlds, and guess who should be there to greet her? But everyone knows already. It was, it's Anakin, obviously. It's Anakin. And he called yeah, her Snips. Pre- Woohoo! He said I the, immediately he assert, said the line, assert, Bart. Yeah. Like, he said the line, Bart. <laughs> I immediately have something to say on this. And, uh, um, hey, Sheev. Re- remember when well, I said um, one... that T... Tease... Or, yeah, if you want to go for Shai. Sorry, just one second. So the episode ends with, yeah, a, a shot of Anakin smiling, fades to black, and then for some reason they play the Imperial March. Um, <laughs> all right, then. Yeah. What were you yeah. going to say, TK? Um, so uh, I think I remember when I said that TCW implied that Force Ghosts can see the future. Mm-hmm. This episode just confirmed it. Well, if he's a Force Ghost, if this is actually Anakin, oh, there's some there's some vagueness here. Oh, there's yeah. so much to break down, but like that's it, not it's most likely a Force Ghost, no matter, though. There's so much vagueness where if you choose any option, no matter what, it breaks something. It's a damned yeah, if you do, if you don't, but also yep. damned if you, you know, just the thing bah. is, like, I, yeah, I, I, I'm hoping it isn't. Work. I'm, I'm hoping it's not a Force Ghost because I think that's the most damaging option, particularly to Anakin's character. But like. To all the, force ghosts. Yeah. However, however you slice it, this is not good. Really not good. I've never seen a show thoroughly destroy its world quite like Ahsoka is attempting to do. It's quite <laughs> literally broken the franchise. There's no well, coming is, back. I'm starting Dave Filoni without any restrictions. He's just able. I'm to starting do to think. No, I'm starting to think there is no Mando movie. This was like like Kathleen Kennedy sat down with Dave and said, "You're fired. You have one last project." And he's just like, yeah, okay, fuck you. Fuck Star Wars. I'm going to destroy it completely before I leave. I can see that. Like, it comes off as he's intentionally trying to fucking rip the world building apart. Every um, single decision in these shows has been, a, thus far, uh, destroying a character or a part of the world in some way. It's ridiculous. Just a quick thing. Uh, this is not like a, a thing on the episode, but just it's an interesting super chat, and I want to briefly address it, which is Stephen uh, Legresley's super chat about, like, Anakin did all these this terrible things. Not- that- yeah, yeah. So yeah, the Anakin as Vader did all these terrible things, and therefore, like he's you know, he, he killing the Emperor doesn't redeem him. I, I've seen this sentiment before. There is a difference mm. between someone being forgiven for what they're doing and someone being redeemed. Those are two very different things. Um, no one is saying that Anakin's final act means that he's forgiven for everything he did. However, it is unambiguous that he by you know when he died in his last moments, he was returned to being the good man that he had once been. That's what's meant by redeemed. He has been pulled back from the darkness. Him personally. That doesn't mean his all his sins have been washed I, out. I literally say this in my Kenobi video. Being redeemed doesn't have anything to do with that. It it doesn't matter like what people think of you or what or, or, or even like what you do really. It matters like what's in your heart. It matters like what you actually are and what you believe. Um and how you go about doing that. You know, you know, like it's <sighs> redemption is a lot more complicated than just oh, all is forgiven. Yeah, absolution and redemption are two are two very different things, um, and often, you know, it's, I mean, this is literally like it's a very common trope. You know, the whole redemption equals death. Like, often people have committed such heinous crimes that the only way to, quote unquote, pay the price to atone for what they've done is to die, and even then, most other characters don't actually forgive them because they personally can't get over what they've done. Um, mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. it's never as simple as. Oh, just also, like, Jolly, yeah, how do you feel about absolutists? Oh, I love absolutism. God, it's so great. Fucking just fuck. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, a, again. A, so yeah, I don't wanna... we see this a lot is because it's much more simple to dismiss someone if you completely just oversimplify their argument and strawman them to make it seem like it's an absolute rather than to actually approach them from a good faith and nuanced perspective. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, again, I don't want to jump ahead because this is like several videos down the line for me. But when I finally write out this script, like, you know, start recording and, and editing the script for my objectivity versus subjectivity video that I am doing. The thing I'm going to point out is like, there is this kind of false dichotomy going around that like, um, one or the other subjective objective is like the quote unquote correct way to do things and everything else is bad. And like with the objective crowd, there tends to be this very absolute statement of like, there is one correct objective way to do things, which is just not how objectivity works at all. And in both cases, both on the subjective and the objective perspective, they're, my real gripe, and this is what I'm going to be getting at in my video, is like it's absolutism versus like nuance. Like I, I despise, as a, someone who teaches philosophy, I despise people who like subscribe to a view of the world that is black and white in any sense. Like almost nothing outside of deductive logic, and even then, maybe not, is black and white. Um, is Hitler saying, black and white? 
Well, I guess he was a white man. I don't know if that counts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he had black um, hair. Oh, shit. Yeah, he had black hair. Yeah, I see even Hitler. Not, not fully black and white. Um, but my point is that Ahsoka's reaction to Anakin should have been one of disgust and shame. But she pretty much reacts to him like they're back to student and teacher. Uh, I mean, pot potentially. No? I mean, I will say that. She, well, potentially, mm. the issue is that they don't commit either way. Like Ahsoka doesn't have any kind of reaction to Anakin, really, other than like a confused garble of like things that could mean this if you're squinting in the dark while drunk. Um, you know, like I don't know whether Ahsoka views Anakin as a purely negative force in the galaxy or what the Le Le Vader's legacy means to her as a person. I don't know if she's haunted in the night by the, the the specter of what Anakin became. I don't know if she's traumatized. I don't know anything because they don't fucking tell me. So those maybe... are really interesting things to explore in a character. Yeah, yeah, they would. Be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah would be. Oh, I said this there's... all the way back in the first stream. I was like, the the shadow of the absence of Vader's shadow in this galaxy, both in this show and all the other stuff, is fucking weird. Yeah, it's really weird. Um, there's someone in the chat asking yep. which is worse, Kenobi or Ahsoka. I'd say Ahsoka, Ahsoka. at this point. Ahsoka. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, it's not Ahsoka. even close. <clears throat> Ahsoka's worse. And you know what? So I guess this. You know what? What I what I would say, what I used to say the last couple of weeks when people would ask me if uh, Ahsoka or Kenobi was worse, is I'd say there's nothing that will ever piss me off quite like Kenobi. So I will always personally hate it more. But Ahsoka is worse now. <laughs> After the, the most recent episode, I am fucking furious with Ahsoka. I, I no fuck this show. I'm just as angry with it as I as I was with Kenobi uh, for different reasons. Because obviously, I, I'm very attached to Obi Wan. He's my favorite fictional character of all time. But I'm also really, really attached to Ezra and Sabine and Kanan and Thrawn and all the characters from Rebels. I really like Rebels, and I really like those characters. I don't. I don't like seeing them depicted this way. I don't like seeing them assassinated. Yeah, bastardized and used up yeah. and thrown away like so much trash. I remember I'm I saw the episode, episode yesterday. This next episode. I saw the episode yesterday. I went into my uh, friend's Discord server and I was just talking about him in the uh, spoiler chat. And I just said, "Wow, that episode was fucking horrible." And some guy just replies with the meme of "quit having fun." And I'm like, "Dude, I'm upset because I'm not having fun." <laughs> What do you think the issue here is? Yeah. I'm not having fun. Like, it, like immediately, ha like immediately after watching the episode, uh, I went into my like my Star Wars group chat on on Instagram. That like I have a bunch of friends in there who all fucking love the shit out of out of all these shows. Basically, um, it sounds miserable. And uh, I said it was bad, of course. Yeah, I said it was bad, of course. And they were like, "Ugh, there he goes again." Uh, and then yeah, and then one of them was like, "Yeah, but Thrawn was in it, so I was happy." And it was literally exactly that same thing that I was talking to Jolly about earlier. I don't I don't remember if that was before the stream or back at the beginning of the stream. Like the same reason that I that like people say they like Kenobi because they like seeing Obi Wan and Vader do shit. And it's like if you actually like these characters, you should be pissed at how they're being depicted. If you actually like Thrawn, you should be angry that they turned him into a fucking idiot. Uh, this is and again. I think because we were at the start of the stream, where we said this. Like the thing it comes down to is when they say, "Oh, I, I liked it because this character was back." What that really tells me is that you never actually liked the character. You just liked the surface elements, the cool things. It kind of reminds me, to, to quote an EFAT video weirdly, of um, uh, cinematic Venom and his approach to Lord of the Rings, where it's like, "Oh, I wanted to see more Lurts. I wanted to see mm, more yeah. Ring Wraiths. They're the cool characters." And I'm like, "Okay, so you're just a child who likes like shiny objects being dangled in front of you, like." You don't actually care about <laughs> the relationships of these characters or what they believe or what they think or who they are or what they're doing. You just want to see cool visuals and like sword and screaming noises and magic. It's like, okay. Then you didn't like these characters. I hate like I hate to break this to these kind of people. Like, and it's fine to like these surface elements. That's fine. As long as you're self-aware of this fact. But there's a difference between those things and liking a show or liking an artwork or liking a character. That would be a bit like if I was like, oh, I really like hanging around with Sheev. He's got a nice voice. I like I like how his voice sounds. And someone's like, oh, but do you like Sheev as a do you like do you like Sheev as a person? Like, do you like his you know, do you think he's, his beliefs are good? Do you think he's got a good sense of humor? Is he fun to hang out with? And I was like, I don't really care. Like, I like his voice. And when when he turns up, I feel safe and warm. It's like, okay, you sound like a moron. 
I'll be the first person ever to admit like I'm a Transformers fan, but like I like it for or at least the movies. I like them for the most surface level of shit. I like Peter Cullen's voice. I like special effects. I like explosions. That's it. Yeah, and that's that's fine. But if but if you then turned around to me and was like, therefore, if Peter Cullen is in a show, it's a good show. I'm like, no, that's right, not no, how that works. Peter Cullen's been associated with some pretty yeah, that- garbage pieces of media. Jolly, like imagine if I jumped into a call with you one day and I started just talking about how great Kenobi was. And like maybe TK or C or like you know like you guys are there and they're and and they're like that doesn't he's not acting like Sheev like that doesn't sound like the kind of things she would say and then Jolly's just like I don't really care he I yeah. I, I like his voice yeah just like, it, it, you know <laughs> but his icon his icon yeah. came on the screen and I clapped like that's some invasion of the body snatchers type <laughs> shit right there. Oh, like, I would say that like pe- these people like never liked the character truly. I th- I think more from the perspective of that they like the characters, but then at this point they only really care about not these characters being portrayed well. They just like that fuzzy feeling of seeing something they like and thinking, "Oh, I know that thing," and then they smile and they feel nice about it without actually thinking about how these nostalgic elements don't really have any meaningful like purpose or depth behind them to actually like really make the moments meaningful because you can have nostalgic moments that's not my problem my problem is that when you see anakin it's like well okay what what purpose does he serve in the story how does this moment actually help ahsoka grow oh she puts on some white robes how meaningful right yeah Yeah. well people people love to say as well like oh you just hate fan service well i love fan service i'm a fan i like being serviced give me good fan service please actually use use the mm-hmm. fan service do something I'm, fun uh, with it. Well, I'm I think, definitely going to clip that, clip I that think out of seeing, context just you saying I like to be serviced bro <laughs> come on see, come see on. I were watching Rogue One <laughs> and like there's a lot of egregiously stupid fan service in there but like it's also you know it has that you know like the reused footage of the like deleted scenes from A New Hope of the Rebel Pilots and stuff and they like repurpose them for the Battle of Scarif yeah. that's really cool and it's really tasteful and it like it pays homage to the original that's cool like, stuff. I, I That's a fan smile service. On my face my son. But it's it not so intrusive. Right. Yeah, it's yeah, not it intrusive. It, it, it fits the context. It's just, it's nice. Fan service yeah. can be cool. Fan service could be nice. Fan service can be and has been really cool in the past. Yeah. Like absolutely. Peter Cullen being. You know, it's when you have Dr. Evazon and Ponda Bamba fucking show up on Jetta and bump into Cassian and Jin. And it's like, ha, ah, they're from A New Hope. I remember them. Like just yeah, that's forcing life. shit for the sake of it. Well, I mean, like you know, I would say that the Vader hallway scene at the end of Rogue One is fan service, but my god, is it good in the movie? Like, not only it's not just <laughs> fan service; it's also a very well crafted scene that establishes like the horror that is Vader and like the stakes going into a new hope, and you know, lends real terror and weight to the scene, and and gives you like the final like dark element of exactly what this empire is that they're fighting. Like, it's just I don't know. It's, Look, it's, it's Max Rebo. Or, 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 <laughs> I, just, Un- I, mean, I just like fair I- unironically that was my reaction seeing him in book of boba fett i was just like oh it's I max just, rebo i just want to see the thing of like canonically it's like the way he survived is like the robot chicken version we just climbed out of like the thing at the end <laughs> it's like oh, i'm so glad i survived that <laughs> jesus actually oh, i'll give you a million playing. space bucks right now if you throw me a rope <laughs> This reminds me too of uh, when we watched the Little Mermaid, she the animated one and the live action one for comparison. We wa- when we saw in the live action one the uh, original Ariel voice actress there as just a brief cameo. It's shit like that that I enjoy, just like a little wink to the people who know, and then for people who don't know, it's not anything intrusive and it doesn't harm the story in any way. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Hey, she. Uh, um, you might want to look in the chat. There's a certain horse calling rebels bad. <laughs> Uh no, fuck off, intro robot. No, <laughs> intro robot. I will say one thing about Rebels, which I, I think it does really well, and it does a really good job at subtly developing the dynamics between its characters. And one of the, the my favorite examples is that without even needing to say the words like "Oh, I love you," bloody bloody blah, between Hera and Kanan, you can tell that these two are uh, basically a couple. It's th- just through their interactions mm-hmm. and how they react with each other. And, and that's great. It, it's, you know, showing and not telling in its ultimate form, you know, taken to characters. And I have to wonder, 
like who the fuck was responsible for that? Because I would have given them a hug and say, "Where the fuck are you?" On, like on all these new stuff, we Simon need Kimberg. we need more yeah. characters who have like subtly developed dynamics between each other, or than just no dynamics being developed at all, or. You know, oh, oh, you know, Ahsoka can't train me because she doesn't want to train me, and you know, I can't train Sabine because she doesn't want to be trained. It's like, oh, just, just what is fuck out of here. As a kind of a uh, discussion of that, I was because I was I watched the last episode with my sister and my flatmate, and my sister and I afterwards we were talking about this, and we were like, what's interesting about like well written characters, even if they they don't have large roles, is like often what you'll see is like little bits of nuance that characterize them, even if you're not paying attention. So, for example, one I'd go to is like. When in in the Fellowship of the Ring, when they reach Balin's tomb and Gimli breaks down crying because obviously like his you know his cousin's dead and Moria's all gone. In the background, when Gandalf was reading the book about what happened, that what the the member of the Fellowship who goes up to comfort Gimli and put a hand on his shoulder is Boromir. Um, you know, Boromir is the guy who teaches the hobbits how to fight because he knows they'll need it. He's the one who's like always concerned about their well being. Boromir is a real leader to his men. That's his background, and all these little things like even if you're not paying attention, they tell you about Boromir. They, they show you who he is and you can pick up on them and there's you know mm-hmm. there are these moments all over the place another really great little one is you know in kung uh, you've all seen kung fu panda i presume um yeah yeah the obviously like the main yeah. message of that movie the main theme yeah of that i movie saw is, them yeah the main theme of that movie is like you know there is no secret ingredient and and it, you know it's just being yourself in the way and the best version of yourself is what you need to be to be a great and you find your worth within yourself and obviously that's embodied in the dragon scroll which has like a kind of you know gold leafed reflective interior so that when you open it it just reflects you back and poe eventually gets that message from the whole that there is no secret ingredient thing from his dad meanwhile the villain um opens the scroll at the end sees his own reflection looks down and the first thing he says is it's nothing um and like that little <laughs> moment obviously like he's being literal but from a character perspective it's also telling you about like how he thinks of himself and like how he places worth on himself and like reflects the themes and the character like all these little moments and i, I could pick out hundreds i could pick out ones in, in arcane in westworld everywhere there's nothing like that or even like in the, in the weirdly in the prequels there are moments like that but there's nothing like that in in the mandoverse and like ahsoka like any scene i could pick out is like oh what's what's ahsoka doing in this scene she's crossing her arms uh, okay um, here I just here I just mentioned you know Ahsoka's master. I wonder what that's going to do in terms of like how her behavior or like what little things we're going to get to to reinforce <laughs> yeah, how like she thinks she about that. Maybe she might tense up, you know, something yeah. like that. Anything at all. Maybe she'll a, look a bit sad. A, no, a shift just in stares. demeanor. Just nothing. Just nothing. It's just it's so depressing. These fucking cardboard cutouts invading my screen. I wish they'd just bugger off. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go back to having paper thin characters than you know, mm-hmm. no characters. Here's the thing about things like Ahsoka. Like, I, I I didn't have any hopes in this show. I I came in and I just had a bunch of laughs at it, and like because I at this point, well, what are we really expecting? But it's really looking at it and analyzing it. It really makes me start to appreciate stories a lot more for in the ways that they don't fuck up and really think about these stories in terms of i don't think the narrative structure of andor is pretty good it is, is good but there are many things that i can sit back and look at andor in terms of characterization or world building or even like all the really nice writing details that they've got in the show and i can think you know what okay you know, maybe maybe i was a bit hard on you like you know you're a pretty good show actually Andor. you know i i liked you originally but you know i i appreciate you so much more or when i go to the prequels and i still look at the prequels like you know they're not that good of a story but i can look at the ways that they didn't fuck up and i can look at the the nice small details that they actually got right and think okay you know what i i appreciate you so much more because i had to sit through uh, ahsoka and saw how low the bar can truly get yeah, it's just, again, like, the most cited example, again, of that kind of thing, Revenge of the Sith, like, Vader, after the painful process of being put into a suit, he's pulled up by Palpatine, what's the first thing he says? Where's Padme? Is she safe? Is she alright? Because mm-hmm. deep down, that's still who he is. He's still a person who, like, puts the people he loves before himself. He's still a good person deep underneath all the shit that's been, like, traveled on top by Palpatine and the, the, all the twisting that's been done to him, but that's still there. Nothing like that. Oh in Ahsoka. God, wasn't it? Wasn't it Cosmonaut Variety Hour who said he should never have to hear Vader say the name Padme? Uh, what was, it, was that him? Or was that, why? Was that it? I, I remember know. hearing that point at at some point. I'm just, I was just like, what? Why? Why, why? why is that a problem? 
I don't understand that at all. I can't remember who said that. It was it was either Cosmonaut or Plinkett, though, I think. It, it, eh. uh, apparently it was Plinkett, Sam Montgomery saying in the chat. Yeah. Which, I mean, Cosmonaut just ripped all of Plinkett's points and, and conveyed them worse anyway, so who cares? Isn't Mr. Plinkett yeah, that was like a Plinkett parody or something? Video. Isn't Plinkett no, like a parody or a something? Different, he's playing... He's playing a character, but he's a he's like you know reviewing it in earnest. Like he actually believes the oh. things he's saying. It's, it's like parody. ER, where he'll he'll play it over the top and he'll be edgy, but it's like there's still real points being made, like he, about what he's watching. Yeah. What the fuck? People always no, no, no. the two, and it's like I mean, oh, who's someone's saying I sound like fuck. Is that me? Oh fuck you! If it's me, I'm gonna leave. I think it's you. Yeah. God damn it. I'll, I'll All right, well, have fun. <laughs> wow. TK sounds like Cosmonaut. Jesus, anyway, yeah. that's fucking cruel. <laughs> how, do I, how do I sound like him? But I want to know how. You sadistic assholes, I swear. Have we ever seen TK and Cosmonaut in the same room? That's well, true, I, actually. I, 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 meet, I, I, I met Cosmonaut, but he was wearing a Stormtrooper helmet. It was really weird. TK is like, actually black. Oh, <laughs> oh, no. TK is actually a Captain Enoch. Cosmonaut and Hello yes. Greedo. Had a baby and it was TK. You know, when I used so to yeah, have no, the people conflate like having a YouTube it. persona, like playing a character, um, as like that being a parody. And it's like, no, not really. I mean, guys, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I was talking to Balin the other day, and you know what I realized is I've never seen Anakin and uh and Vader in the same room. Just oh just uh, you know, oh my food God. for thoughts. But you yeah, guys remember. Um, Oh yeah, do you guys yeah. remember when there were theories that like uh, Balin was going to be some kind of alternate universe version of Anakin? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm what? Stupid. I I remember what? that. I was <laughs> I, not, I was I ready to call, I, I was this. ready to, I was ready to call that show like the worst thing I've ever seen if it turned out to be true. Your Balin, it would be. Sucks. Yeah, I'm already tempted to call it the worst thing I've ever seen. I mean, there was the it's there was one the rumor the worst I saw shows out there. Yeah. There is the rumor I remember seeing where someone was like during the you know what turned out to be the the Clone Wars flashbacks we we're gonna get like an we we're gonna get like an alternate universe where Ahsoka went to confront Anakin on Mustafar and, and killed him and I was like no can we not, can we can we please not do that <laughs> cycling back a bit Sheev to your point of uh, like playing a character versus being parody a lot of people defended Nostalgia Critic uh, and his points um, when I made my Pirates of the Caribbean Nostalgia Critic uh, debunk series. Mm -hmm. um, and they were saying, oh, it's just a parody. Like, he's just a parody reviewer and stuff. And I'm like, no, he's not. He's playing a character, but he's reviewing these films, or at least apparently trying to. Um, How many people defended Doomcock the exact same way when I started criticizing him? Well, exactly. It's like, I don't care if they're a parody or not. It doesn't matter. They're bringing up shitty points that don't make any goddamn sense. And there's going to be some schmuck somewhere who takes their point as actual gospel. Ergo, I think it's perfectly fine for me to say, Fuck you! You're wrong. You put you put your points out there. I think it's more than reasonable for me to point my put up my counterpoints. You know what I mean? I just right, I don't even see the point in like playing no. a character though. To like like I don't see the point in playing a, a parody of a person making points and like intentionally yeah. making video essays or like reviews uh, making points that you don't even believe. Like what a waste of time. No, it's miserable, and then your fans don't even really know what you actually believe as a person. Just yeah, be, be honest. Like it's not hard. When you hear I, my I, points on my channel, it's just me speaking from the heart. It's not like yeah, I play up something sometimes, but that's because it's entertainment. But like, it's still me speaking. There's also Does an the ocean have a heart? Of them? No, I buried it in chest. Uh, I put it in a chest and buried it on Ela Cruces. Ah. I mean, the thing is, like, there's a logical extreme of this as well, which really bothers me, which is the the kind of ER thing, right? Where it's like, if if you're if the if the character you're impersonating is is borderline a Nazi, even if you're not actually a Nazi, like at a certain point, it ceases to matter that distinction. Like, if everyone in your audience is taking you at face value, and you're actually inspiring these people, and you're actually passing along this doctrine, even if in a, if you, even if in your own private head you just think it's a great big meme, um, in practice, you are actually doing those things, like. Obviously, that's a very extreme example of that phenomenon, but like this happens. I'm just, I don't know, doing a bit, doing a parody, doing a, an interpretation of someone, like even in jest, that's fine. But I, I just wish people would be a bit more careful with this. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually why, weirdly enough, out of all of uh, Doug Walker's uh, characters and shows and stuff, 
weirdly enough, I think the bum reviews are the best ones he's done because that's the one where he's like playing this fucking crazy ass like hillbilly uh, hobo guy. And he's basically calling every film he watches, even ones that are obviously terrible. He says those are great. Like that's where the comedy comes from is just he's so clearly wrong. Like that's actually good. If you're playing a character, oh, yeah. that's cool. There's a what's that show called? On Cinema, the one with uh, Greg Turkington and uh, Tom. Fuck, what's his name? The, there's these are two like film review. Like they're 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 basically playing like characters. One of them is like the host of the show, um, who like thinks really highly of himself and and is like really stupid, but and like doesn't know what he's talking about. And he has he thinks he has all these like like he acts like he has all these guests on a show when in reality Greg is the only person that he like ever has on and Greg is playing the character of like a of like a snobby film reviewer who who thinks he's like a huge movie buff and is treated as such by by Tom but like in reality he doesn't know jack shit and like and all of the reviews are super vacuous and super um like surface level stuff like yeah this character or like you know like this movie was directed by this person and it had these these actors in it playing these characters, and I thought it was a really fun time, or I thought it was bad, and that's basically it. And they'll they'll give like inconsistent rating systems, like three bu- buckets of popcorn out of five. That's a really funny show because like they're being so like they're they are playing characters who don't actually, you know, they're they're making fun of reviewers who don't actually say anything in their videos and aren't consistent with their standards. Like I love on cinema. I don't know if you, any of you guys have watched it. No, send it to me. That sounds fun. Uh, sure, I'll send it to you. Greg Turkington's Phantom Menace review was one of the funniest videos I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> nice. Oh man, Chief, at some point we still need to do that. Oh, um, in the chat. How, how, we, how we'd rewrite I, the I think he said he's going to join, I think, unless I'm interpreting his message oh, yeah, wrong. we should do that, Jolly. Uh, I just left the theater after seeing the extended edition of Fellowship. Oh, neat. Uh, now's the time to talk about real peak content. Well, he might join, but we're basically done. Like we've already talked about the show. We're kind of just uh, fucking around episodes, at this point. The episode. Do you know first. how how I would emphasize the the, the characterization of a lot of the show? Is it almost seems like a facsimile? Like someone saw that. Like okay, this moment we're gonna have a character moment, but there's nothing beneath it. Like they they have this moment between in the first episode between uh, Sabine and, and the little hologram of Ezra, where he says, you know, same shame that I left. Uh, that kind of sucks, but don't give up, I guess. And then the, the hologram ends, and it's trying to be like, oh yeah, this is such a, a nice moment, and the music's going. And it's like, but there's nothing there. It's meaningless. It's a meaningless message. You just thought, okay, well, let's have a character scene. And then the, the drama between uh, Sabine and Ahsoka, it's like someone looked at someone else's character drama, made this up on the spot, and then didn't think about how this is going to actually... Uh, affect anything in terms of the the deeper meanings between these two and and their dynamics or even who they are as people and that it's almost like it's just a the best way to describe it it's just a facsimile it's a facsimile of a character rather than actually being a character yeah it's um it's skinwalker syndrome right it's it's like it's like all these characters were written by a prototype version of chat gpt that forgets that they exist in between being piloted around to do the things it thinks are necessary in the moment for the, to, facil- you know, to facilitate the plot. Um, for, uh, actually, a really good explanation of this, because the, there are characters who are like the uh, example of this phenomenon, which is if people haven't seen JX's video on Doctor Who, The Fall of Doctor Who, it's a very long video, so like, you know, if it's not your cup of tea, fair enough. Obviously, but there's a bit bad. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit where she talks about um, the companion characters from Jodie Whittaker's era and how they are literally just cardboard cutouts. And it, she does a really good job of, of describing exactly this phenomenon. That's a really funny thing, for example, where like we're in, when we're in the episode, we're introduced to these char- characters, um, an alien creature puts a bomb, like a, an actual bomb in all of their necks that if they try and remove will blow them sky high and could kill them at any moment. And when they're told about this, the, the sum total of their reactions is one of them going, oh, Okay, how do we get it out? I was like, "Oh my god, react! You've just been told that your lives are in mortal danger," and they're just like, and then like, the next the next episode, it happens again to one of them, and his only reaction is like, "Oh, can things stop putting things inside of me?" I was just like, "Who? What are these? These these the reaction these, to these having changelings phone getting wiped is like more distressed than having oh, yeah. a bomb in your neck." 
Ryan, Ryan is more upset that the doctor like erases his phone into uh, his phone's data than he is about finding out that he's got an alien bomb on his neck. It's it's fucking bizarre. It's I it's 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 worse in this show because at the very least. Um, there is a little, little something meaningful that you can derive from, let's say, uh, Yaz being a police officer. Uh, and there are many characterizations that you can derive from that background. But they, it's like the show just doesn't do it, like it just forgets. Where, whereas in Ahsoka, it's more like they don't even have that. Well, like, we kind of do, right? Because we can have... derive from the characters is just, like, terrible. We we kind of do right because we uh, with Sabine as well now. Weirdly, we keep on having people like, "Oh, you stink of Jedi," or like, "Are, are, are you a Jedi?" Or like, you know, what does it mean to be a Jedi? Or I left the Jedi. Like, someone's Jedi ness seems to be like the only version of that we have in the show, but it is sort of there. Of like, "Oh yeah, we're we're vaguely aware that this should mean something to you. We just don't know what, and we're not going to explore what either." It's all very strange. Ugh. This this whole show, the whole of the Mandoverse, the whole of Disney Star Wars feels like a very strange fever dream cooked up by like uh, a, a very emotionally stunted alien that has only ever been told in passing whilst drunk someone's third-hand experience of what a human being should be acting like. It's, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I'm confused. I'm tired of this fucking franchise. I'm so tired of this fucking franchise. And I'm particularly tired of like the certain breeder fans on Twitter who just like will go to the mattresses for this. <sighs> yeah, like I'm thing, and therefore, how dare sense. you say anything bad about it? Yeah, it gets really insufferable. Um, just what's going on with this franchise and its fandom itself. Like, I can't even discuss Ahsoka publicly without having some moron say something that's actually probably the most out of field, stupid point to bring up. Um, no, you just hate Whammon. You just hate the Whammon. That's your problem. I just hate whamming. Yeah, no, that's ridiculous. The funniest thing to Whammon. me is how everyone reacted to like, Sheev's tweet about was it how young Ahsoka was when she completely fucked up Maul. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah no, we, we addressed all that at the beginning of this stream. The toxicity. The thing, uh, the thing we said off stream, which I think is quite funny, so it's worth repeating, is um, because obviously in one of our Mando streams, we we briefly mocked Gina Carano, not even from a political perspective, just like her silliness and like botching her contract the way she did and like how she couldn't really expect any different. And like people came after us in the comments mm. being like, oh, you alt left, you alt left commies. And I was like, well, the one good news about this is like now we're coming after, the, now we're coming after the left primarily with this reaction. So I guess we get to go back to being <laughs> alt right Nazi grifters again. We <laughs> Just ping pong and back mm -hmm. and forth. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I am, I, I have no political opinions like... on my own. I'm entirely defined by this. It, it's almost like we literally said in the Mando stream, do not try to like do not try to gauge my political beliefs based on how I feel about a Star Wars show. Well, I've said before, people are that probably true. never going to be able to guess my political views on anything, and it's not even worth bringing up in discussion when I'm talking about fucking movies and TV shows. I can't wait for something I said in my Ahsoka video to be taken out of context, posted on Twitter, and then people derive my political opinion from my accent. Oh yeah, that yeah, that's happened to me as well. You mean oh. the accent that, you, that isn't even real? We know yeah, for a fact you know, that your accent is fake, shiny. That was really embarrassing too, considering yeah, what you were saying was all make really sound fucking... smarter. What you were saying was really fucking true in that video as well. So it's like they just completely avoided everything you said, jumped to the fact you have a fucking accent, and then called you a right-wing <laughs> grifter. What See, the what fuck I, is wrong what, with these people? What I really like about that is, like, Shiny is actually English and has an English accent. I am not, and I have a very posh English accent, so I can't wait for someone to tell me that I'm faking it to make myself sound clever. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, they got the, me. Oh, Mon Dieu. So... So are you going to put on, like, a voice when you do your videos? Like, the closer look? Or are you just going to talk like a normal person? Oh, I'm going to talk like a normal person because I'm not a complete <laughs> spanner. Okay, good. I hate the closer yeah. so much. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to... She, I'm just going to talk in French. I'm going to speak in French, but with, a, but with a German accent, just to throw people, you know? Nice. <sighs> I'm going to speak in galactic basic. I would be really funny if you spoke like fucking Zazu in your videos. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'll be Scar. He's got a much better voice. Uh, that's <laughs> honestly very true. true. If you sing Be Prepared, then it's an automatic subscription for me. 
So you joke, yeah. like so. Okay, so, so C, C will know this. One of the videos I have on my list of things I'm going to work on at some point is one on like piracy and like the golden age of piracy. And I really want to get like all the YouTubers I know to help me sing like a chorus version of the the pirate song from Muppet Treasure Island of like <laughs> a pro professional pirate where I'm going to be Long John Silver. That'd be so fucking if you're, hilarious. Yeah. If you if you're all up for joining me in a pirate cover <laughs> of uh, of that. At some point, we'll do that. <laughs> what well, I could, I could uh, shoot golden gunpowder message too, and I can get him in there because he's a big. Pirate. Oh, absolutely! Could... Just get all the pirates as possible. Um, I'm gonna have to if we're finished with the episode. I'm gonna have to duck out soon because it's um, getting a bit late for me. But um, yeah, it's about time to wrap I will this say, up. I think we are back. So pe everyone in the well, again, everyone who's on stream now, if you'd like to join us, and everyone in the chat who'd like to come back and listen to us, we're gonna be covering episodes five and six, uh, Sheev's boss willing, on Sunday. Um, Not me though. These assholes scheduled it for Sunday, and I work Sunday. Fuck you. Well, yeah, I've got a. I'll be able to get. I've got a I'll be able to get Sunday free. I'm afraid, see, that I have a funeral on Tuesday, so I, I can't rearrange. I'm very sorry. That wait, is wait. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's like Chief. So, so, so you said you were free all yeah. Sunday. Oh, neat. All right, can we start at like I'll five p.m. then? Like Eastern. Yeah. No. no oh, fuck you like then. Two no. in the morning for me, mate. <laughs> it's like 2 a.m. for Jolly. I'm not gonna do that to him. Burn in hell, then. I will. I, I, have you not seen yeah, my avatar? Actually. I'm from there. <laughs> Where do you think I got this neat hat? Well, anyway, from? it wouldn't 5 p.m. Eastern be like 10 o'clock for us. Shut up, shiny. I'm not encouraging TK. I'm not doing it that late. <laughs> Fuck yeah, you, we, TK. We're gonna be going for. We're gonna be going for several hours. I'm not doing that shit to Jolly. That's true. Yeah. Um, I will just as a, as a treat to you all. It was my birthday the other week, and my my sister made the world's most deformed Snorlax Pokemon cake, which I think the world needs to see. So I will send you all that image later, and it can haunt your nightmares from <laughs> oh, my fridge. That's amazing! Happy <laughs> birthday! <laughs> Cheers, man. But yeah, I, I will I will sign off. Um, thanks everyone for in the chat for coming to listen to us. I hope you enjoyed our, our stream. And Chief, as always, is is always such a pleasure to be invited onto these streams and to be in the company of such good lads as all the rest of you guys. So and we'll hopefully, yeah, I'm hopefully see you all on Sunday. Thanks for coming you can. on. All right, then, guys. I'm gonna Bye. End, the, end the stream now. Bye, everyone. Woo! <laughs>